All right. All right. Looks like we're live here at Myth Vision. Uh, you know, it's a sad day when knowledge and free speech are silenced as a secular scholar was recently fired for showing artwork depicting Muhammad. This decision to dismiss the individual is a blow to academic freedom. Perspectives. I think that's ex extremely important, especially if we're trying to minimize the amount of Islamophobia and other things that are out there in the world, but also the ignorance in the West of what the Middle East, you know, has, what history is there. In fact, I recently interviewed uh, Dr. Reuven Firestone, and in his book, he mentions how the West sees the Middle East and pretty much Southeast Asia, this region from Palestine, Israel, down to Egypt, Arabia, as this mysterious place. Like, we don't really understand it. And of course, the way most people, I would say, in the West understand it is through the caricatures, the stereotypes, and other such things. My visit to this region in the world was enlightening, extremely educational. So instead of shying away from difficult, nuanced conversations, we should strive to have them in a respectful and open-minded manner. This, this dismissal of this scholar is a reminder that the suppression of ideas and knowledge is the true enemy of progress and enlightenment. And so we're going to discuss this matter, this professor in a secular university, um, actually out of Hamlin University in Michigan, I believe, Minnesota, sorry, Minnesota, was fired um, for depicting Muhammad in art. And I believe she's a professor, specifically an art professor. So if you're going to educate people um, of different art through different cultures in different periods of time, you know, you would think maybe there's a chance we could bring this up. And this isn't like a religious private institution that is like specifically Muslim or something. But you know what really struck me about this whole thing is I was surfing through my Twitter. In fact, I might as well pop that up just to kind of give people a tease here. Um I am on Twitter. If you want to follow me, I think it's at Derek podcast or something. Anyway, I was looking up Hamlin university. Let me see if my Twitter. So if you at Derek podcast, that's right. So I'm surfing through Twitter and I come across a few of the Islamic scholars or, you know, Quranic scholars that I'm friends with and they didn't comment on it, but they posted it. And I was like, Oh, hold, hold up. What is this? I'm looking at here. Um, scholar gets fired, right? She gets fired for depicting, having art that depicts Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. And I'm like, well, what's the case here? So I figure I'd have this conversation with you guys live. I started a poll on the side in the chat. So be sure to vote. Let me know if you thought this was just or unjust, if it was right, or if it was wrong, yes or no. And, um, with that being said, let's get our intro started and dive in. All right, there it is. Shortened intro. Welcome back to Myth Vision. We're talking about a controversial subject right now in terms of should this professor have been fired for depicting Muhammad in an art class where she warns people, hey, if this offends you, you know, don't don't be present for this. Um, and the interesting thing. For those who are tuning in, I'm sure we'll have some Muslim friends joining us in the chat. In the chat, um, and you'll hear differences among Muslims. In fact, that's the point of what I'm going to be reading you in just a second. But the interesting thing about this piece of art is, it's not art that was produced by Salman Rushdie. This is not art produced by an anti-religious other worldview. I can't wait to debunk Islam, or I can't wait to debunk Christianity, or I can't wait to debunk Judaism, or any debunking platform or, or region of the world. It is Muslim art produced by Muslims themselves. Think about this for a second. As you engage this conversation, 
This isn't even produced by someone else. This is produced by those who identify as believers in Allah and who follow the Prophet Muhammad. That's important to understand out the gate, no matter who you are, right? So I'm a big fan of freedom of speech and a big fan of allowing freedom of religion and even opposing that freedom of religion, opposing religion. So having the freedom to do that as well. And for example, the attack on Salman Rushdie, right? You heard a lot of different voices that came up when that happened. I thought that was horrible. I thought what happened to him was dead wrong and there's no way to make that right. And I know many Muslim friends who thought the same, even if they disagreed with Salman Rushdie's uh, point of view or thinks that Islam is bad, this and that, right? Well, in this case, none of that is the case. There's no violence here. You have an educational platform in a secular university, right? Which is not even a religious university that is supposed to push a certain view. But let's try and play a little back and forth here for a second. Because after 9-11, serious stereotypes and caricatures of Muslims goes all over. If you're a Muslim, you're going to blow yourself up. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. Extremely controversial stuff. I mean, everyone who ends up wearing a turban or a hijab or is going to a mosque or something like, are they secretly conspiring? Are they in connection with Al-Qaeda? Are they talking to extremist groups in the Middle East? And these are things that people like, you know, when you don't know and there's a mystery or you see what happens because there are extremist groups in Islam, they start to think everybody's that way. So a lot of people are trying to be sensitive in the West, and rightly so. But have we gone too far? Has this university crossed the line? And I want to start by reading an article specifically written by Muslim friends and people who are Muslims themselves and how they see it. And so I spoke to Javad Hashmi earlier, and he is in. He goes to Harvard, and he came on the channel recently talking about using historical methodology to try and understand who Muhammad was, what Muhammad actually did, what he meant to say, what the Quran teaches, not what medieval or even centuries later exegetes and uh, historians, scholars, if you call them that, that are gathering hadith and traditions trying to interpret the Quran. Let's start with the Quran. What is the setting? What does it say? And instead of cherry picking certain surahs to try and say, okay, he was in his power at this time. So this is why he's saying, go on with no mercy and destroy the enemy, things like that. And there are various scholars with different views. Anyway, he had me really open my mind and think, wow, taking this approach, this could change the game on how we, uh, how we view the historical setting of the Quran, which is early and Muhammad himself. And may maybe this actually would take away some of that violent view that is projected onto him when the, I'll say the, the political powers that, that be centuries later in the Islamic voices when they're ruling the world and they're in power and they're saying, go kill, destroy, things like that, right? So maybe this will help in a way, understand Muhammad in that way. So let me read you something that I think is a very powerful um, statement. And this comes from Muslim Public Affairs Council. As a Muslim organization, and I'm going to expand this a little further to zoom in because I think everybody should read and see what's being said here. All right. Statement of support for art professor fired from Hamlin University. It is with great concern that the Muslim Public Affairs Council, Impact view the firing of an art professor, Erica Lopez Prater, from Hamlin University on the grounds of showing a 14th century painting depicting the Prophet Muhammad. We issue this statement of support for the professor and urge the university to reverse its decision and to take con uh, compensa compensatory, sorry, comp compensating her action to ameliorate, which is to make right, the situation. Sorry, I couldn't get that word out. News sources report that the matter reached the university administration after a Muslim student complained to them about the professor showing the image in class. Subsequently, undergraduate students at the university received an email from the administration declaring the incident to be undeniably inconsiderate, disrespectful, and Islamophobic. Because the professor was hired as an adjunct, her contract was not renewed and she was effectively fired. 
as a Muslim organization, we recognize the validity and ubiquity of an Islamic viewpoint that discourages or forbids any depictions of the Prophet, especially if done in a distasteful or disrespectful manner. However, we also recognize the historical reality that other viewpoints have existed and that there have been some Muslims, including and especially Shiite Muslims, who have felt no qualms no qualms in pictorially representing the prophet, although often veiling his face out of respect. All this is a testament to the great internal diversity within the Islamic tradition, which should be celebrated. See, I love how open-minded this is already, showing we aren't under one voice with one particular viewpoint about this. And in fact, it was Muslims who actually created the art in the 14th century. So um, this is this, it seems, was the exact point that Dr. Prater was trying to convey to her students. She emphatically prepared them in advance for the image, which was part of an optional exercise and pre prefaced with a content warning. I am showing you this image for a reason, stressed the professor. There is this common thinking that Islam completely forbids outright and any figurative depictions of any de or any depictions of holy personages. While many Islamic cultures do strongly frown on this practice, I would like to remind you, there is no one, no one mono, monothetic, is it monothetic? Monothetic Islamic culture. I was going to say monolithic, but the painting was not Islamophobic. In fact, it was commissioned by a 14th century Muslim king in order to honor the prophet depicting the first Quranic revelation from the angel Gabriel. Even if it is the case that many Muslims feel uncomfortable with such depictions, Dr. Prater was trying to emphasize a key principle of religious literacy. Religions are not monolithic in nature, but rather internally diverse. This principle should be appreciated in order to combat Islam Islamophobia, which is often premised on flattening out Islam and viewing the Islamic tradition in an essentialist and reductionist manner. The professor should be thanked for her role in educating students. Muslim and non-Muslim alike, and for doing so in a critically emphatic manner. Sorry, empathetic, empathetic. In a time of rampant Islamophobia, highly offensive and racialized images of the Prophet Muhammad abound on the internet and on social media. We consider these images to be inappropriate and not dissimilar to blackface or anti-Semitic cartoons. Even if such images and their makers are protected by law, social opprobrium is due to them by all those who are uh, reasonable and decent. As Muslims, of course, we must respond in a calm and graceful manner as, been, as befits our religion. The servants of the compassionate are those who walk humbly upon the earth, and when the ignorant address them with insulting words, they respond, peace. Given the ubiquity of Islamophobic depictions of the Prophet Muhammad, it hardly makes sense to target an art professor trying to combat narrow understandings of Islam. There is an unmistakable irony in the situation which should be appreciated. Additionally, misusing the label Islamophobia has the ne negative effect of watering down the term and rendering it less effective in calling out actual acts of bigotry. bigotry. Finally, we stress the importance of education in the Islamic tradition. On the basis of our shared Islamic and universal values, we affirm the need to instill a spirit of free inquiry, critical thinking, and viewpoint diversity in the university setting. So I'm going to come back to me for a second to point out this article or this website that was actually written and I think helped commissioned or at least written by uh, Javad Hashmi or he helped in participating in it. I'm not sure if his name appears on this. Um, it just is from Impact, but he helped to formulate some of the things here. This is amazing. Hearing this from Muslim voices about what happened and how they're seeing it should tell you they're not monolithic and that. Not all Muslims think alike. And for me, it is people like him. It is Muslims like him. I want to see succeed. I want people to become more educated and not fundamentalist in their views of their religion. That goes for Christianity. That goes for Islam. That goes for Judaism. That goes for any and all religions. Educate. Expand your knowledge. And I think the more we do that, while we're going to see disagreements with other views, you become more tolerant also of these ideas because you're 
aware of them. You are reading of them. And if you're so narrow-minded that you think that what happened to this professor was right and good, I think you need to keep educating yourself and expanding your knowledge and understanding of the religion that you say you participate in. Because I think it was dead wrong. But then again, I got a poll over here for anyone voting. I'd like to see those numbers. I'm curious to see if anyone actually says what happened to her was justified and right. I really am. Uh, but we'll get to we'll get to the poll at the end. That'll be something interesting to see what happens there. Um, I'd like to read just a couple more of these little articles, and then I want to show you some of the images. And I think in these articles, you'll see what they're depicting. In fact, as was pointed out in the Impact article, or I'm just calling it an article here, a web page. A Minnesota university is under fire for dismissing an art history professor who showed medieval paintings of the Prophet Muhammad. And here is an example, Prophet Muhammad in the cave of Hira, page from Hamla Yi Hidari manuscript. So that's in 1725, Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. And notice that his face is covered. So there's an example of, I guess you could use the term kosher art, right? Uh, this is This is actually good or okay for some, but for many, whoo, you're getting close. You're getting close. Don't do that. You're not allowed to do that. And then um, here's another one. You can see he's no face. They made sure they deface them. And it looks like they went a step further in this picture here to deface what looks like the, I would imagine the immediately fo the immediate followers of the prophet Muhammad. So I don't know if Ali's here, Umar, um, you know, who the, uh, I'm trying to think, my brain's mush. The early leaders, there's like three or four of them in particular. And uh, I can't think, so maybe the audience can help me out here. Coming to you, make sure, help me out here. What am I trying to say? The first four caliphs, is it, I think that's the proper word for them. I'm looking here, seeing if you guys can help me out. What it says, properly censored so we don't see 10% of the picture. I'm looking. Nobody's writing unless my thing's not updating. Abu Bakr, yep. I see that. I see you down here, Vin. Yeah. Smash that like button and support the stream, y'all. That's right. Appreciate that. Seriously, appreciate the love. Appreciate it. If you have any super chats, feel free to hit me on them and I'd be happy to, you know, address those or bring them up or even whatever you have. It doesn't have to be on the topic specifically here, but I really do appreciate it. I did want to cover this because I think this is an important one. Here's the one that really I put on the thumbnail. I cut out the part where you see the angel Gabriel and Muhammad. Um, let's see if we could zoom in so you can actually see this better. So here you can actually see a depiction where they don't deface it. That's really, really interesting. And I like art. I like seeing depictions of Jesus and other religious art. I love learning about how artistic and the imagination is of people. Of course, this isn't what he would look like. Most likely you'd see him and be like, whoa, but this is, you imagine even the region in which this may have been created, the influence of that culture and how people looked at the time what, what do we see happen with European art of Jesus? The dude looks European. <laughs> he comes out looking like a white guy. Um, so I imagine you might see that even with Asian art depicting Muhammad and the early followers when they do make paintings. You see a reflection of people. They're, they're perceived. It's like that ancient, uh, what was the name of the philosopher who said that if horses had gods, their gods would look like horses. And if dogs had gods, their their gods would look like dogs. Well, through the reflection of the art here, we're seeing kind of a cultural, you can look and see, okay, are they from Asia? Is there some Asian perspective here on drawing, you know, Muhammad? So uh, this is the article. I put this down in the description. Again, another piece of art where his face is not visible, but they do depict Muhammad. Notice that there's like the glowy fire around too. So he has been extremely, uh, I'd say legendized or mythologized, even in the art depictions to the point is so sacred. You're not allowed to draw pictures of the guy, but you can draw pictures. Notice they're free. Even the ones when they deface them, 
They'll draw pictures of angels. They'll draw pictures of humans. And in the one above, the first four like followers that led Islam, they even defaced them. So I did a recent interview we're working on right now where was uh, Umar the Messiah, we called it. And it goes into early voices that you know Jews are thinking that he's going to rebuild the temple in Islamic you know, around the seventh century, we're finding voices of, hold on, are they going to re rebuild the temple in Jerusalem? And are, is the Messiah going to come? Is this the Messiah? This is a good question with Robert G. Hoyland that I ask, which is a scholar in Islam as well. Another one where you see him defaced, everybody else has faces, but you can also tell like it either looks Persian or Asian in some sense. This, this is definitely, it doesn't look Arabian, if that makes any sense. Another thing, here's another one. He has an actual face. He's riding on a creature, a mythical creature. And we know the story where he flies off up into heaven. Uh, depending on which which one you're reading, the which mythological tale you're, you're reading it from, it's either from Jerusalem and one of them is from Mecca. I was reading this recently in um, a book that I've been reading with uh, Gabriel Said Reynolds. We have an interview that I hope that's going to be released here shortly. And it's really interesting. He uses the same methodology of historical setting with the Quran and how the rise of Islam happened. Another one says, and, and this is in the idea of privileged, Hamlin University is accused of privileging extreme Islamist views and pandering to students' whims by firing professor who showed medieval paint or painting of the Prophet Muhammad in an online class as 8,000 signed petition to support her. So a lot more people, I suspect, are uh, backing up the freedom of education and stuff. And this is here in America, right? So I understand fighting bad ideas, especially in a university setting. Like if something is going to influence and educate people in a very negative light, like if you're a professor and you're out here actually promoting Islamophobia and you're really encouraging negative outlook toward people who hold to religious views, yeah, I understand dropping the hammer and trying to suppress that from happening in your universities. I mean, bad ideas get suppressed on my channel. Um, but at the same time, in this case, this just seems like negligence on the, the university's part. I don't understand it. We're back to here. I was going to just scroll through and show different art. You can Google. This one always interests me. Um, I like the showing the Kaaba stone. Let me see if I can just upload that into my stream yard here so you can actually see it up close if it'll be if it'll go up big screen. Uh, I gotta delete something. Okay, now we're gonna do it. And you can actually see up close, I hope. Here we go. Boom. There you go. Look at that. That's pretty cool. I think that's Muhammad. I I would imagine, but I could be wrong. I googled uh, images of Muhammad, the art, and here's one. It looks like he's putting in this swath or some type of blanket or something that looks like the Kaaba stone. And um, I like to just go through and check stuff like this out. I don't know about you, but it's really cool to see how people depicted him. And these are like not non-Muslims. These are Muslims. And why would we so silence their voice and their art? When these are people who were as faithful as they believed they could be to their tradition and their religion, like I, I guess I could imagine if the Quran outright said something, right? But even then, what if someone found a way uh, to cherry pick and said, I'm sorry, I think that was added later or whatever. You can kind of find this in the tradition between Shia and Sunni split on Ali, and you could find like there are differences in how they interpret the data well, what if we silenced uh, the Shiites because, well, we go with the majority and the Sunni have more people in the religion? I mean, where do you draw the line? What if what if we silenced um, Protestantism and Christianity because, well, Roman Catholicism has more numbers or Eastern Orthodox combined with Roman Catholicism has – where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? And I just think that it's silly, especially in a secular setting. I would imagine this might happen somewhere in the Middle East. But come to find out, there are actual places in one of these articles, it's actually even shown in universities in the Middle East in certain areas. 
obviously there are in other areas that you they wouldn't allow this, but the, I'm trying to figure out where that is. Let's see. I was reading earlier. Islamic paintings of Prophet Muhammad are teachable history, not fireable offenses. Hamlin, okay. Trying to see if we could find out where. As an expert on Islamic rep representations of Prophet Muhammad, I consider the recent labeling of such paintings as hate speech and blasphemy not only inaccurate but inflammatory. Such condemnations can pose a threat to individuals and works of art. Hmm. Wild. And this looks like that painting comes from this page. I, uh, a painting showing the Prophet Muhammad receiving the beginning of Quranic revelations from God through the angel Gabriel. The 14th century painting is part of a royal manuscript, the Compendium of Chronicles, written by Rashid al-Din. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It is one of the earliest illustrated histories of the world. The manuscript includes numerous paintings, including a cycle of images depicting several key moments in the Prophet Muhammad's life. Hmm. Second image made in Ottoman lands in 1595 to 1596 is part of a six volume biography of the prophet. Over 800 paintings in this manuscript um, depict major moments in Muhammad's life from his birth to his death. So I think this is just wild that they let her go over something silly like that. Here's an, I think we went over this one. Yeah, we did. I think in one of these articles, and I sourced them in the description for anyone who's watching later, you could find that this isn't just a Western thing. Like th there's a lot of people, you know, who actually show this in their art cl classes at their universities all over the world. And here we are trying to silence someone because, well, are we getting, are we overcompensating? And I think this is exactly what's going on. They did not investigate this properly. They did not deal with this data properly. Like I could imagine if a professor's out here like making inflammatory remarks toward Muslims and then showing the face and then going above and beyond in a professor setting. People have, like the article said, uh, I really highly recommend if you're going to read one of these, Muslim Public Affairs Council, Impact, go read this one. This is from the voice of Muslims and understanding. And it's so well written. I really hope that people would understand like they even say, we understand the freedom in the laws, we get it, and people have the right, even though we don't encourage and we wish that people didn't do these things. Like they even recognize Western law here. But at the same time, if this were something in a educational setting that it was something inflammatory, then you might go, oh, okay, okay. Well, obviously, I would be opposed to an academic trying to teach in a setting like this, which encourages negative perceptions of people, right? And that's usually what happens. Like if I can go and show you critical things about the religion, which I do all the time, I'll show you stuff that I think is wrong about religion, about Christianity, Judaism, the Hebrew Bible. Even in Islam, we could find the voices and go, hey, but you know what's funny? I'm finding this out more and more. I can go to Christian academics who are not conservative, right? Who are very critical. And they would be happy to probably point out issues that they might find with Paul's teachings they would disagree with things that Paul might say, and they say they're Christians. They would say they disagree with this or that. And I could go exactly to the same thing with probably Javad Hashmi, who is in, a Muslim, who's also an academic, and he's you know, written his PhD, all of this stuff, and have him come on, and he would tell you in early Muslim sources, this is how I you know, definitely disagree with how Muslims have taught things, and here's how, blah, 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 and be critical of it. Um, at the same time, maybe, I don't know, uh, I wouldn't put words in his mouth, but maybe he finds something that he personally thinks is dated in the Quran. And he goes, well, that's not for all time. Like this is not something we should practice for all time. And I think that the more we educate ourselves, the more people can realize, Hey, we don't need to do that just because Muhammad did that. Or we don't need to do that because the text in the Quran says this, this is a dated manuscript for a certain period of time. And some of these things we don't practice. Now, if it's a moral teaching and it's teaching us and guiding us to do something good or whatever, we'll follow that. And I encourage people to do that. I encourage people to do that. And there you have it, right? So back to just plug in the Patreon, right? I, I 
been trying to keep growing this, we've got all sorts of stuff come out here. And I hope that people will try to support us in what we're doing and educating people because we drop the courses, right? We have the Mark course, which I pinned in the chat. For those who haven't, we've updated also. Some people had problems going through the pay uh, section through PayPal. We've done, uh, we're, there's a credit card option too to be able to get the course, Gospel Mark course, short little plug. I'm excited about this. This is with James D. Tabor and reading the Gospel of Mark as Mark. This is all in 4K. I interviewed it at his office in Charlotte, North Carolina before I moved to Washington State. And uh, I hope people will sign up checking out this course. It's I got too much running. That's why it won't let me do it. So anyway, um, back to you guys. Let me see what you've had to say because I'm sure the chat has developed since starting this thing. I'm going back to the tippy. Um, at least in the West, the worst they can do is fire and cancel. In other countries, they would be killed. I guess it would depend on the country, right? And where people are extremely fundamentalist and they come together with a group think on this idea. And yes, there's some terrible ideas. I wish people would change about that. Lighten up. Seb Oz says she deserved it because it was a racist thing to do. Hmm. Well, that's strange. It was a racist thing to do. I'm really curious because also, just to highlight one thing, in one of these articles, there was a picture of the professor herself. And here, I want to show you this. Here's a picture of the professor. So she's not a white lady, just to give you that out the out bat. Professor Erica Lopez Prater was fired by the University of Minnesota and had, had her class dubbed Islamophobic in an astonishing rebuke after several students, including Aram uh, Wetatala, right? Okay, sorry complained that she had shown a depiction of the Prophet Muhammad. So no, I'm sorry, this is not the professor. This seems to be the student who may be Muslim, I imagine. So I am I am offended as a Muslim. I'm choosing to label this image of Muhammad as Islamophobic and endorsing the view that figurative representations of the Prophet are prohibited in Islam. Hamlin has privileged a most extreme and conservative Muslim point of view. Professor Am Amma Khalid, who supports the fired... Hamlin professor. So a lot of Muslims are actually voicing their opinion in support of the professor. I don't know how that would be. I just don't get how it's racist. Someone says, are you joking? Deb, good to see you in the chat. Always good to see you showing up, showing support. Really appreciate it. Um, T Bishop. So T Bishop, didn't you cancel Dr. Bob for some of his personal social political opinions, which actually started getting tied into my platform. Um, at the time, T. Bishop, you could have said that many people called myth vision price vision, right? So I had him on so often that his views, which started to get expressed in the public on YouTube, started to actually overlap with what myth vision is doing. And so in this, this is in the same kind of vein of something you could say here. And I would imagine, by the way, I paid Dr. Bob for all of his visits and presentations that he would do on Myth Vision. Um, I would imagine you could say, well, didn't you fire him from Myth Vision in a way um, for his particular social political views? And in my opinion, yes, I did. And in my, uh, my assessment of those views, after talking to him first, saying, hey, these views that you've presented, I don't agree with, and I find them to be very ugly views. Um, would you be so kind as to come on for 95% of the audience that I have on Myth Vision and express, in a, express that you did not mean to offend people with these views and that you're not this person that you are being presented as? Can you apologize for this coming um, off this way? Can you show empathy to an audience that is seeing things in this light? And he told me, hell no. He did a, um, he did a uh, uh, well, Jordan Peterson. I will never to the tyranny of the system and the da-da-da-da-da and did nothing wrong kind of thing. And that's where it was like, all right, we got to part, Rick. We have to part ways. He's educating here, and I'm trying to make sure that people realize we're not going to be okay with ideas here on this platform that come off extremely 
bigoted in some manner of respect, or at least have been taken this way with no apology necessary. In fact, he feels he's been done wrong in the process. And so when both sides feel like a wrong has been done and there's no way to try to find a way to compromise on that, don't know what else to do. In the case of this professor, there was no, let's talk about this. Let's let maybe we should mitigate or find a way to try and take away from the art that might be in this class. Like let's, let's be very careful about this or whatever. No. And in fact, many Muslims support the view of presenting it, even if they disagree with themselves depicting it like, Hey, it's in your setting here. You're trying to educate people in the cultures, things like that. So anyway, T Bishop, I see you from time to time in the chat. I figure I'd address that because it is in a similar vein and I am for freedom of speech and allowing people to have freedom to express their ideas. However, uh, there is nowhere, as I've heard Vosh say one time, I watch Vosh on YouTube, who gets into the political arena a lot more than I will ever. And he pointed out, there is nowhere in any setting ever where anyone's ever been able to just freely express any and all ideas without certain limitations. And I think that that's true as well. So I am obviously um, in support of what this professor was doing. And I'm also hoping that the reversal of this happens with the academic setting. For me, I'm taking it to kind of point out like with Bob Price, I love Bob and me and him have actually made up in email correspondence. We communicate from time to time. However, in order for me to want to platform and have that be something that I'd bring back, I would need some, some kind of apology, some kind of showing an empathy to the audience instead doubling down and showing no empathy um, is what I've seen. And that doesn't mean there can't be a change. A lot of time has passed since that's happened, but um, you, you got to express some type of sensitivity to people that we're communicating with. I'm not Pine Creek Doug. I care what people think and I care how people feel. I'm not dead inside as he uses the words himself. Sobex in the house. Good to see you. Melody Joy, good to see you here. Dalai Lama in the house. This is what you get when religious insanity is tolerated, Lilith says. I think, I wouldn't call it that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it religious insanity. I would say, I guess, there's a lot of factors in this. I can't, you can't put it on to just one thing. In light of what happened in 9-11, like I said at the beginning of this, there has been tons of hate, if you will, towards Muslims in America due to it. You could even say there's been hate towards people from China to some degree in light of the pandemic and how the president kind of just would like go out of the way, China, you know, things like that. And you're like, oh, what the heck? And you have seen some violent crimes that have happened. People might blame people who are from Asia or China or things like that. So how we talk has an impact. And that's something we do need to consider if we're humanist, if we care. I mean, I'm a humanist. So if we care about the sensitivity, if we care about trying to create a better world, I think that that's something important to pay attention to, especially since we're social creatures who've evolved this way. We've evolved as packs and we should try to find a way to make that work as packs together rather than uh, cannibalize each other. All right, scrolling, scrolling down. Islamophobia is a BS term, especially in this case, I would say. So I do think there are certain cases where you could find for sure it appears like Islamophobia. All right, I'm caught up uh, to where I was before. Z yes, thank you, man, Bear Pig. That's the philosopher I was thinking of that was talking about the horse god and the pit and the uh, a dog. If it had a god, it would look like a dog. Same thing goes with artwork, right? <laughs> so art is forbidden as per Sharia law, Shia and Sunnis. All right, let me scroll down here, catch up to you guys. Myth Vision, have you ever heard of or looked into the Telford in Rotherham scandals? Will blow your mind what happens when people fear losing their jobs over Islamophobia. I have not. Interesting, interesting. 
Okay, so Drockner's Ford says, at least within the first two centuries, some Muslims had a prohibition on images. And look, if they were, if they lift that prohibition, cool. Good for them. If Christians had a moment in history or early on thought, no, no depictions, no um, images, right? Graven images, none of that. And then later on, they start to be more relaxed on these particular things. I obviously don't have any fundamentals in which I would enforce on people within my religion to say, you must do this. But then again, I'm not, I'm not religious. When I was, I would imagine that this could be something I would have been all over and been, oh, hold on, we need to, no, we shouldn't do that. There were times where I actually thought about that with certain churches that had crosses and altars down at the front and stuff. I started wondering, hold on, this, this isn't biblical. We need to stick to Bible, not this pagan worldly image of Christ and stuff. There were times where I thought like that. All right, scrolling down. I'm glad you are one of the few white people on the internet who is brave enough to criticize this. If you criticize the religion, you are Islamophobic narrative. Well, I mean, I'm critical of all of the religions, and yet I'm friends with many who are within the religion. I think as we mature, as we try to find a way to communicate on these things, and even if we disagree, that's important. And being able to be critical is also important. I think that's one of the benefits I have of living in the West is that I can be critical. Okay. Someone says they think Seb Oz, Seb Oz was trolling. I don't know. I don't. I didn't get that from the comment. But then again, you know, a far sight. For example, to T Bishop earlier says, "Nah, man, Bob did that to himself." And then said, "I love Bob, but man, he really went out of his way." I agree. Um, I love Bob too, and I wish that things could be reversed. I would love. I can't tell you how much I would love that to change. And, uh, I mean, I really grew very, very close and it was, I mean, like it, it, it's something that really hurt me. I even took those videos down cause I didn't want to hurt him anymore or his family or any of that. And I was hurt by it. And I think I reacted and that, you know, you kind of need time to, so I, I took videos like that down. I didn't even want those like out there anymore. I want nothing but good for him and his wife and his family. Um, but at the same time, I also realized that he cared more about his principle than what I needed and what I wanted in terms of to make it continue with myth vision. And uh, it was really just a shit storm, to be honest with you. But I would love to reverse that and see things change and be able to interview him to have uh, educated academic Bible talks, right? Without um, going into that. I don't expect him or want him to change his political views. It's about showing empathy and sensitivity to people in the world when you say things that are seemingly harsh. That's really the point. And um, that is that has been the goal. I guess you could say I'm, I'm more sensitive to how people feel about these things. And I want to be that human who plays tug of war inside. Not just, I don't give a sh what you feel and how you think. I stand for this and that's it. I think it's important that we have that ability to be flexible. We have to have that ability with ideas. Um, and nobody, Bob has a flexibility with those ideas, but political, social ones, it's like he's been extremely solid on those. And I would love to see him be more flexible and realizing, hold up, the world is not 1930 forever. It needs to change. We as humans need to change and progress and become better. Anyway, there's my little rant. <laughs> Words to live by. Be dead inside. Definitely not me. Melody Joy with the heart. Appreciate, appreciate. Hope you guys don't appreciate my little preaching. Don't. Uh, I hope you appreciate or are not opposed to my little preaching here. Oh, we got some super chats. You cut the line when you super chat there. Far side in the house. Thank you so much for that super chat. You have true salvation. Islamophobia exists, but it's not the same thing as disliking Islam of Muhammad, or I think you mean or Muhammad. We have to realize that people have different ideas of whom, uh, of whom Muhammad was. I think that's the case. 
Farsight, I agree. I think it's in- <laughs> being sensitive is important as we approach this information. Understanding and being aware of, of a bigger picture takes maturity. But I also want to say that if you read about Muhammad from later exegetes and scholars and how they depict him, you read hadith, you read about certain biogra- biographies that talk about Muhammad and what he did, and you make a judgment moral call about those actions. You're not wrong in making certain judgment calls. But this is why I, I, I'm bringing in this caveat, right? I think you could follow along and everybody watching can. When I was interviewing Javad Hashmi, he brought in historical methodology. And he said, actually, we shouldn't just trust because exegete said or certain well-known famous uh, scholars in Islam say, this is what Muhammad said. This is what Muhammad did. This is how. And they start to depict certain historical settings later, trying to put the Quran in this setting. We need to understand these people have their own personal time bias culture. They're in an empire. They have, they want Muhammad to look like them. So we should be very careful on what Muhammad himself actually did. This is the skill of being able to be scholarly and depicted this way. This is where it gets interesting, right? Let's take it off of Islam. Let's take it off of Muhammad for a moment. Let's go to Jesus. I have been known to criticize. You all know I criticize Christianity. I am extremely critical, and I'm all about this and that. And I think Jesus was an apocalyptic rabbi-type Jewish preacher who— May have had some good things, but then there are some things I'm like, "Mm, we don't need to do that. Let's not do that. If you grant that Jesus said that. So I had Dr. Dennis R. McDonald in my house recently. We recorded a course with his mimesis showing the Gospels borrow from Greek and the Bible, right? We're going through a 19 lecture course. That'll come out as time goes by and I edit it and all that. You're going to want to check it out, I promise. But then I did side interviews with him and he told me what happened in his personal life testimony of his life. He was a Christian. He was a radical fundamentalist. Then he saw the most racist things he's ever seen in an evangelical Christian college that he was a part of, and he had to leave. When Martin Luther King Jr. died, they claimed he was an apostate. They would not put the flag at half mass and would not have a moment of silence for him, and all of this stuff happened, and he was like, hell no. But through his journey, he pointed out he started to get critical and study the Bible. He went to Harvard University. He went to, you know, all sorts of different places. And he found out that the gospels have so much legend that his assessment of Q and trying to assess the historical Jesus, that Jesus was actually very liberal in his Jewish community. He stood for things that weren't strict Torah observance like Moses, you know, with the the pericope adultery, the woman who committed adultery or committed fornication or committed a sexual sin, all these you know, Jewish figures are picking up stones ready to kill him, kill this girl. And they go, should we not stone her? And Jesus is writing in the sand. And anyway, that's late in the gospel of John. His assessment going back through the synoptics, he thinks there was something to it. And his point was, Jesus was lifting this strict Jewish observance. So he found this kind of Jesus, historical Jesus that he thinks was against that strictness. Sure. Date, you could say there's plenty of dated things about Jesus, but the point is, is he found a Jesus that wasn't depicted by gospels or even later church fathers and such that looked even better than what he gets depicted as in certain settings. Anyway, I say that to bring that back to Muhammad to say, sure, if you're reading scholars, exegetes, and history, you can do that and go, hell no, this is harsh, this is bad, I don't agree with it. I do the same thing with Jesus. I do the same thing with Moses. You look at Joshua, look at the killing of Amalekites with King Saul. The Bible has a lot of stuff that are pretty ugly and bad. And I call a spade a spade. I think we should do the same and without having to walk on eggshells, have that opinion, be willing and okay to do that. At the same time, be aware of people who are making the attempts to try and understand using historical methodology. Is this really a true depiction of the historical Muhammad? And what if Muslims got Muhammad wrong? Not saying all Muslims, but what if these exegetes that are writing about him, even if the majority got the majority of Muslims today, let's just say, are wrong about Muhammad? Imagine if that's the case. I would say most Christians in the world are wrong about the historical Jesus. Anywho, 
uh, far as I, I did this because first of all, thank you for the super chat, but also I think it's important to give you a, my thinking process and how I'm flexible and being the Bruce Lee philosophy, be like water. Water enters the teapot, it becomes the teapot, right? We should, this is what we do. This is how we do it. And I think it'll make us better people. Thank you so much for the support, the compliments earlier, and this super chat. Constellation Pegasus is in the house. Thank you, man, for always showing up. And, and I really appreciate those super chats that you always send. It, it always goes a long way in helping me here to keep doing what we're doing. I remember kids getting into trouble with shirts showing B-52 bombers with American Airlines logos on them. Political correctness insanity goes to all levels, including religion, now I suppose. I imagine there's all sorts of stuff that can be um, shown within, you name it, political, religious. I think there's overlap between those, of course. Um, in many settings where you're going to see, you're going to see political correctness. And sometimes while I think maybe they jumped the gun on certain things, it may have prevented uh, things getting uglier or worse. Sometimes like in this case, the poor lady got fired. And I think that that's just over the top, it, way over the top. It's not like she's out here trying to do something negative or bad right? She's not trying to hurt anybody in, in, in an academic setting. Good to see you here. Thank you so much. Uh, the Muslim apologist depictions of any prophet in Islam is considered as blasphemy. So, um, you brought the super chat up and I'm glad that you actually brought this as a Muslim apologist. And my question is then why did so many Muslims depict art of Muhammad and thought that they were okay in doing so. I'm curious to get your answer on that. All of this art that she's depicted is not drawn by Westerners who have some bias against Islam or are trying to be antagonistic toward Islam and Muslims. Like this was art that was drawn by Muslims who were absolutely fine with depicting Muhammad. And then the places where they depict him and they just don't have his face shown, there are those type of art, artistic pictures. So you could tell that there's variations on the sensitivity of how Muslims view being able to depict the prophet himself. And um, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on that as we go through this live. It's like saying um, it's blasphemy um, in Protestantism to pray to Mary. That is blasphemy. Let's just say, right? I, I can't say that it is, but in certain forms of it, I'm fairly confident that it's blasphemy. It might even be blasphemy in certain forms of extreme fundamentalist cult-like groups, maybe JWs and others, to celebrate Christmas or to do something like that. But we have many Christians who celebrate Christmas or whatever. They depict uh, nativity scenes or something. Like, where do you draw the line? So, you know, in Islam, what is Islam? Is it monolithic? Is it your definition? And therefore, everyone? needs to fall in line with your category and understanding of this. I mean, there was a, a Shia Sunni split for a reason, and there are very various offshoots of this. Do they not get a voice? And to me, they all get voices. To me, all of them are, are, deserve a voice, to me. Uh, but to someone who holds to a particular position, I could understand why they would want to be reluctant about saying, well, they're wrong. And here's why. And they might want to make an argument. They might try to go to the Quran or they might go to early scholarship on this and say, this is what one of the earliest companions and they have a chain of command that goes all the way back. And I would say that's oral transmission, not literary, but oral. And I am very, very suspect of oral um, tradition being exactly what goes back to some people. Um, I would even go so far as to possibly say the development of the Quran, right? I don't know, and I'm being very critical, but if Uthman is the one who actually, I can't prove they didn't find quotes that we have in the Quran from leaves and stones and, and, and people who survived the battle that they realized needed to bring this in in the tradition. I can't prove that's not the case, but I also am suspect of that being the case, and maybe there is some development happening here. Don't know. 
I'm willing to grant that these could have gone back to the prophet himself. I'm willing to say there was a development up to Uthman. I don't know. Could they have played a part in it? Who knows? Anyway, that rabbit trail. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me jibber jabber on that one. <laughs> Appreciate it. Hit the like button, everybody who's watching. I hope that you do so because if you do, um, the YouTube gods pay attention and they go, hey, we're going to help this channel get more attention. Drop some comments. Get some conversation going in the chat. Thank you for these super chats. If you want to confront me, you want to ask me a question, you want to get my thoughts, feel free to super chat. It helps support the channel and I appreciate it. Constellation Pegasus is back. Killing the enemy today isn't as bad as insulting them today. I guess insults go too far in today's political correctness USA. <laughs> Oh man, I don't know. I mean, I get the gist of what you're trying to say. It's like, it's almost better to just kill than to insult by words. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily think that's the case. I really don't, especially even what happened with Salman Rushdie, right? I'm bringing up an Islamic situation where a Muslim attacked him, uh, stabbing him. Like that really struck a chord with a lot of people more than I would say just words. Um, that was really bad. But here again, not all Muslims agreed. Even if there were lots of voices who did, a lot of them thought, this is horrific. This is bad. And in fact, many of them quoted the Quran, right? Uh, you kill one man, you kill all humanity or something. It, it, this quote that is in the Quran, which some scholars say looks like it's also from Jewish rabbinic writings, the Talmud and such, um, that they quote that. And they believe that what that person did that day was absolutely wicked. Anywho, thank you uh, again for the super chat. I get it because it's hard. And I feel like the truth is not black or white usually. There's always a gray area in life. I try to live in the gray. I try to live in the gray. There's sometimes you might see that that shade, that um, spectrum of, of light and dark might differ um, depending on what I ate for breakfast. Thank you, Constellation. Really appreciate that. Uh, really appreciate that. All right, scrolling down, scrolling down. Constellation is back again. Is it horrible to think Allah had anti-aircraft fire technology to pelt these eavesdropping jinn with stars? <laughs> is it horrible to think? Uh, the way you phrase that's hard for me to get what you're asking me. But um, I would say that if we interpret this as... Allah is literally sending, like throwing comments, asteroids and stuff like that to try and fight off demons. This sounds to me, if there's some validity to this, I would say that this is probably a time stamp on letting you know the thinking of people in the time, in the era in which this was written. Again, I do this with the Bible. I have not done a deep dive on this. I'd be, I'd be curious to know what pre-Islamic Arabia says about jinn, or uh, this idea of God trying to pelt jinn or something. Is there anything in the literature can we know to help understand what this is? And is this something that we could say, that's a seventh century idea that God is, th these things running across the sky, we call them asteroids and comets and things like that. Um, shooting stars are actually God trying to pelt jinn. Don't know. I've heard some people try to allegorize which is a common thing we find in biblical studies. You find something, oh, God didn't mean that, or this didn't mean that. Jordan Peterson does this a lot. Jordan Peterson, and this is why I did my video critiquing him. I'm not against people trying to allegorize. It, I think it moves in a better direction. It defangs fundamentalism, which is very important because it's a literal interpretation. But um, there's a moment in which you go so far, your brain falls out. And someone like Jordan Peterson, who has a very staunch, hard, objective morality view, objective truth, this kind of view. He really sounds not very objective when it comes to interpretation of anything. It's so vague and esoteric and meta narrative, meta, 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 that it's like, we're, I don't get the objective here. And I've even said in that episode when he might even read a passage where the Amalekites, Yahweh commands King David to kill every man, woman, and child of the Amalekites. Leave nothing alive, including the cattle, the livestock, you name it. He doesn't fulfill that wish, and he ends up getting demoted from being a king. 
and I think it was prophet Samuel that was alive at the time, according to the text who comes and he's like, Whoa, I hear this. And you got the King over here and you didn't kill all the cattle. Oh, I'm going to sacrifice the cattle to Yahweh. He did not tell you to do that. Boom. Revoking your kingship. I imagine Jordan Peterson would come and go, see what was meant. What really was meant was when Allah was going to throw these stars, actually what this meant is that there's a constant battle between good and evil within the world we live in. And I'm making the analogy. There's this battle between good and evil. The Amalekites represent the internal struggle of the, of the mind. And the man, woman, and child is in all of us. And like you can see how I'm quickly divorcing the context and the meaning of the text to make it mean whatever I want. Then turn around and talk about how objective I am about this or that. And I find that weird switch that comes on and off in people's minds. It's just something we all do, I guess. We find something, we go, ooh, let's let's defend this as best we can to mean something else. However, I could be wrong on what this means. I haven't done a deep dive constellation, but I would maybe, I know I will at some point. Maybe I'll consider doing that and jumping into that. Thank you again for that super chat. Teresa in the house. Teresa, thank you so much for the super chat. As a former teacher, we tried to make accommodations for students with different views. So uh, as a former teacher, you're getting people's experience here. We try to make accommodations. And I think that's what this professor tried to do, who said, like, you, this is optional. You don't have to take this. And then the complaint happened and pff, lost her job. So I, I, I mean, can you imagine if you tried to make accommodations or even fair warnings that, hey, in this next episode, if there's any Muslims, because we know it's religiously blasphemy, as a Muslim apologist said earlier, um, in their particular form and version of Islam, they're not okay with that. Like in this next class, th there are going to be depictions, and this is part of history that Muslims actually discuss. It's almost like no, that's kind of a hard category to bring up. I'm thinking of Nazi Germany and what happened to the Jews. Imagine if that wasn't because it's it's too it's sensitive material that we can't teach about it or something. I think it's important that we teach things that happened in history and and even in a class that isn't about art that you can talk about these things. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm curious to know what the poll looks like at the end, Teresa, on this. And uh, I'm glad that you were teaching. Now, I hope you enjoy not having to teach and enjoy your life as is, but thank you so much for the super chat. Okay, rolling down. The Muslim apologist, again, thank you for that super chat. Those are Shia art and not Sunni Muslims, which have always forbidden such art. Try finding such art in the Sunni Muslim world. They don't exist. That's exactly what I, why I mentioned earlier that there are different traditions within what we would call Islam. And what you call Islam is probably different. There's much overlap, I'm sure, between Shia and Sunni. But what you call Islam is not what all Muslims call Islam. And um, I personally, because I deal with religions all day, as you know, you watch my channel, I personally hope that more Muslims become less strict on things like this. That's my, my I, I hope more Muslims feel comfortable producing art, playing music and instruments and coming up with songs, finding ways to be poetic. Because I know that in early, I just read this in Gabriel Saeed's uh, book, The Emergence of Islam, early traditional, I can't even remember, it's a pretty long title, um, that there is like this polemic against poetry in many ways. And that they believe that jinn or demons are what causes people to be poetic and to write poetry and things like that. And I don't know if, depending on the Muslim you talk to, how they feel about that. I'm a huge fan of music, a huge fan of art, a huge fan of um, being able to be poetic. And um, I guess if your religion is like anti these things, your particular version, I would love to see that change. You know, I really would. I understand that that's how Sunni Muslims think, but I personally would love to see that change. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Sunni. I get no, uh, my voice means nothing in their community in terms of what I think about that, but that is my thoughts. And I would love to see it become more progressive and adapt and change over time and not think that the only time 
and the final time of all prophecy in anything that we can really learn. The ultimate truth of anything comes from the seventh century. I, I don't think that's the best uh, world in which we're trying to build off of. So, but I do appreciate the super chat and you pointing out that this is a Sunni Muslim position. And most Muslims, I would say statistically are Sunni in the world. That doesn't mean that's right to me. Um, I would say most Christians are Catholic. I would find a lot of issues with maybe Catholicism. We could dig into the examples of certain things I would say didn't happen or aren't true, but a lot of that stuff develops over time too. So Catholicism is like a snowball that's on the top of the hill, rolling down, picking up stuff as it rolls and it, it changes ideas. Of course you have creeds, certain creeds end up coming out and solidify stuff in stone. But even today uh, there's changes happening even within the Catholic church. So I hope to see that. And I imagine there's changes even in the Islamic world. So it's not like it's completely stagnant. And, and staying in the seventh century, there are changes that are happening. I imagine even in the Sunni Muslim world, different Sunnis probably have different views about how to view certain things. Not maybe art. I don't know. I haven't talked to all Sunnis on planet earth, but I'm sure there are ideas in which they're becoming more open and progressive on things. Thank you so much for that. Really appreciate the support and seeing you in this chat. Okay, scrolling down, I know that I got more because it's popping up on the top. It's letting me know that you guys are throwing something at me. The inquisitive mind. Why images on, is that a moon? That, uh, I can't tell what that is. Is that a moon's? Moons in Islam countries, not offensive. I can't tell what that is. The Ghost of Myth Vision. Appreciate your super chat. I can't tell what that is. It looks like it's a moon from my my end, but even when I zoom in, my eyes is playing tricks on me right now. So maybe I can see it as I go down. You guys can chat and let me know what what that what that is. But I don't know if that's because the moon it has a crescent moon symbol on the flag. If that's what you're talking about, excuse me. Thank you so much for that. Paul Kickling in the house. Paul, good to see you here. The West's protection of Islam is pathetic. Muhammad was a psychopath. You just need to read the Quran and Hadiths. So, Paul, this is exactly what I was referring to earlier. If you read some of the Hadiths, right, and you thought this is historical, this is what Muhammad actually did, then I understand why you would be definitely adamantly against these ideas. And here's the interesting thing. Some of the things we find in the Hadith, many Muslims, friends of mine are like, eh, nope. And then there are some that the, this Hadith is uh, reliable. This one's not. There's a debate even in Muslim communities. But I get where you're coming from. If you see some of these, you know, Hadiths, you're going to go, this is bad. This is bad juju. Um, but then there are the Muslims who are like, no, these hadiths aren't good. So I do think that there is a lot of Islamophobia that has happened since 9-11. And I know that because I've had friends. My father, keep in mind, is a retired Green Beret in the Special Forces. He went to the Middle East, was in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran. He went in all three countries during this time. He came back, and I know for a fact that the perception of Muslims and, and, and those who are Middle Eastern, you name it, is definitely been triggered from the act of 9-11. And so there is, in a sense, uh, a trying to protect from universalizing or just generalizing all Muslims under this uh, flag, this category. And I don't think we should do anything of the sort. I've even caught myself in the past where I'd made a post, Muslims, da 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 when what happened to Salman Rushdie, I thought that was the most, like, I hate what happened to him. Even if you disagree with Salman, you think he's a bad guy or you think he's apostate or evil or whatever. What happened to him, I think, was wrong no matter how you slice it. And I kind of generalized and went, uh, uh, got angry in a, in a post. And then I had some Muslims saying, we hate what happened to him too. You know, The way you worded that, though, makes us all look bad and help us out. We are on the same side. We want to fight bad things like that as well. So it's one of those things. But um, in light of what happened to this lady, I don't know what was going in the minds of these people other than they're so sensitive and they're becoming so politically correct here that they just 
by by professor by islamophobic and it's like are you kidding me cut the crap we need to be very cautious and careful how we're using these terms you know so there's damned if you do damned if you don't and we need to be careful but you have that right to express this and i understand why you think that i don't know uh I don't know how Muhammad was. I don't know his morality. I know perceptions of him through writings about him later. And then I could read the Quran and I could see a struggle of a man in a time. If I put myself in his shoes, I could empathize somehow a little. I can't really imagine being there because I was not there. But I try to empathize. And there's a great book, a great book called After the Prophet. And there's also The First Prophet. And it's Leslie Hazelton who wrote it. And it's not the most historically accurate work, but it gives you a general outline and story of a man in Arabia with massive empires constantly at war, killing each other. Here they are in little subgroup tribes fighting and killing each other. And here's a man born in a world like this. And so I try to understand him in his historical context and try my best not to make moral judgments in his historical context, though, if you try to take the seventh century and plant it here today, I will make moral judgments. So it's um, tough. It's a pickle that I'm in, but I really do try to get myself into their shoes. Same with Jesus. And in fact, I hope, I repeat this, people understand me. I seriously hope that our children's children, if we exist in a few centuries, the way we're going, I hope that our children's children are critical of us, but also understood we're trying. We don't know. We're, we're, we're not omniscient. We are just doing the best we can as far as we know. And even those who are wrong in some situations, you know, don't stick to their ideas. Do better than us, children. Do better than we did. Learn from our mistakes. Go further. It's, it's when religion comes in and says, this is it. And for all time, you must live by this type of thing. That is stuff I am not a fan of. There are certain things, wisdom, you could say, practical application, why sayings. And if you do wrong to others, you don't want them doing wrong to you. So don't do wrong to others. I feel like that kind of is a permanent, we should stick to that moral ethic, right? That's a good thing. Other things, maybe not so much. So. Thank you, Paul. I think you and me probably agree on this too, by the way. I am critical of Islam. I'm critical of Judaism, Christianity, you name it. But there's also a fine line of being careful about hatred at people who believe these things or hatred towards them. You you might even hate Islam. I know atheists that hate Christianity or ex-Christians who hate Christianity. They've been harmed by it. They've been hurt. And I understand that. And I think their voice matters. I really do. But I also hope we can try to mature and find common ground to communicate. And if there's Muslims who are more progressive and they're not coming from the category that you came out of, can we have that conversation? Can we find a common ground? Mm. I I've been repeating this a lot, but I think it's important. Ali Rowan, good to see you in here. Gate balance analysis, Derek. Technical question to other viewers. Does Derek's screen and chats he reads from all appear out of focus? while the sidebar for live chats is crystal clear. Um, maybe my maybe my internet's playing games and you're not seeing me clear because maybe my computer isn't quite coming through the way that it should. Am I coming through fuzzy or are you seeing me clearly? I hope I'm coming through somewhat clear. Mar, good to see you here. Develden, intellectually mature adults must have safe discussion space to decide what probably happened in the blurry past. I may be offended by some religious ideas. I am not significantly harmed by them. Thank you. Appreciate the support, being a member, a Patreon. By the way, Margaret, I meant to write you. I have interviews that I did with Richard Carrier while he was here at the house that I'm going to be putting up on Patreon at some point. And uh, your question was asked, so there's in 4K. I really appreciate you showing up and supporting here. Um, yeah, I think we need to mature. And we need to have those safe, con we need to have conversations that allow us to understand each other better. For example, if you go onto many apologetic Christian anti-Islam channels, 
you're going to get mostly a single narrative about Islam and a painted picture, which is four stages of jihad, if you will, that has been developed inside of Islam. And those four stages are when Muhammad was in Mecca and he didn't have power, he was persecuted and so were the believers. You can find this in the Quran, at least hints of it, that he was persecuted, that they are being critical of him. He didn't do anything to attack or fight or anything like that. Later in the Medinan passages, as is painted in some scholars in the West, even take this position. This is why you see this narrative. Because early exegetes, I'm not going to say early, early, 150, 200, 250 years after the Quran, after Muhammad's life, I'll say, let not say the Quran, but after Muhammad's life, they're depicting this idea that once he got in power, in political power in um Medinan territory, he then goes pick up the sword, fight them wherever you find them, these kind of things. And this is typically the one picked up by anti-Islamist uh, Islamic people. Um, this is the narrative that is presented by them, whereas you might find a softer approach because it's not that clear cut on what actually happened with Muhammad using historical methodology. It's tough. What do we want? Do we, so I want that conversation, and I think many Muslims like Jah Javad Hashmi, and I brought him up a lot during this interview because he also wrote the article, and I recently interviewed him, um, about a statement from Impact, M-P-A-C. It's in the description. Again, just to show everybody, this right here is the article. And Muslims are not monolithic, and they don't think the same thing. And in his case, he does not agree with the voices of these ex exegetes about Muhammad and what he did using historical methodology. It's not like he just doesn't like it and he just wants to throw it away. They, he makes a case historically why those Muslims would have said that about the prophet because they were at an advantage of power in a situation where that would have been something they wanted the prophet to do. It's interesting. Margaret, thank you so much for that support. Good to see you in the chat. Seriously, appreciate that. Humanist Reformation in the house. Thank you again. Wow, $20 super chat. Really appreciate that. Religions of all kinds have no right to tell the rest of us we need to follow their rules. This is good. I, 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 I agree with this. Why do religions all need the rest of us to follow their beliefs? Ridiculous. Well, humanist, it's built into some models, I would say, within Islam and within Christianity. And at some time, Judaism had this model where they went to convert. It was not a common thing. It was not the all-time thing that Judaism had. But some scholars have acted like Judaism was on the knock-on-your-door Jehovah's Witness task trying to convert the world to their belief system because of competition with early Christians. Others think no, it was during this period that you see Christianity grow and, and you see them trying to go and make these people converts that you also would have seen Jewish um, would evangelist, I guess would be the term, to try to convert people to Judaism. Um, it's not for all time because oftentimes there's a conversion process and you're not really a child of Abraham, depending on the Jew that you read uh, within rabbinic literature and Jewish literature, you name it. It's, it's, it's a fun topic, but it's built into this idea of eschatology, usually. So in the end, my God is going to win. And if you don't convert, you'll die. You'll be thrown in hell or you'll be, you'll be destroyed in some way. Or even in their prophecy that at some point, our God said to the prophets that one day the nations will flow in and they will all recognize the truth of our God. And there's an optimistic outlook and it's not always a destruction kind of eschatology. But when your eschatology and your God makes a promise, some of its adherents believe that they need to self-fulfill those prophecies. The apostle Paul was one of them. So when he goes out to convert or conversion is the term I'm using, even though Paula Fredrickson says turn, don't use the term convert to turn them from their idols. If you're a pagan or a Gentile or whatever, and to turn Jews who are off astray to the truth of Jesus being the Messiah. The point is he thought he was fulfilling scripture. Even Paul in his own letters thought like he thought like the prophet uh, that God knew him before he was born and prophesied that he would or 
predicted this day that he would be born. And he was going on a mission to convert Gentiles because scripture. He's reading scripture and that scripture is inspiring him on a mission to accomplish something God spoke. And I think that's something you don't see in Buddhism. Like they're not mission orientated like that. If there are sects of Buddhism like that, I'm curious because I'm wondering, did they get impacted by the missionary activities of Christians? Because we do see the East and West kind of connect at some point. You have certain forms of Christianity. What is the name of it? My brain's mush here. Um, it starts with an M, Manichaeanism. The Manichaean Christian sects were like very esoteric, very Buddhist-like slash Christian. And uh, you wonder, did Buddhism take up some of these categories? If you see any Buddhist missionaries out there, is it because of that? I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, it's Abrahamic for sure, right? You see this in Abrahamic religions. And um, I don't know. I just wish they'd let us be. I do wish that. And we don't need to follow those rules. I appreciate that, humanist. Really do. Scrolling down. Rational mind. When you haven't studied Islam, you think that Muslims are bad and Islam is good. Hold on. When you haven't studied Islam, you think that Muslims are bad and Islam is good. Once you have read Islam, you realize it's the opposite. So you think, okay, so that you, okay, sorry, I'm processing this. Then the opposite's true. So Muslims are good, but Islam is bad, is what you find out. I can actually, I can actually sympathize with this super chat here because I think that most religious people in the world are good people. I really do. Um, and, and when you say Islam, this is the interesting point, right? We're universalizing again. I know Muslims that's, that have esoteric ideas. They're Gnostic in their thinking or they're esoteric. They kind of have like this vague interpretation model that isn't strict and literal. Um, but I also know Muslims that would probably agree with the more strict fundamentalist approach. And there are some Muslims, you kind of have to wonder, like, are they good people that have literally been so sucked into, let's just take jihad, for example, and what we find in radical versions, radical versions, right, that are out there that are politically motivated and and just really violent groups, um, take Al-Qaeda or other groups like that. Are they bad people or has their, have they been brainwashed and drank the Kool-Aid of their particular understanding of Islam that leads them down violent paths? This kind of enters that debate between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson over is religion and dogmatism inherently bad? Like we've even seen dogmatism without religion, right? You've seen it with political movements, whether it be China or Russia with Stalin and different things that have happened in World War II. Like dogma is a bad thing. And I imagine if we educate people and people become more flexible in their minds, they're, why would you want to go kill and cut people's heads off or things like that? You understand a bigger world, not this small bubble of Kool-Aid we're making you drink. But I do agree. I think most Muslims are good. And in fact, when you don't know about Islam, the perception and stereotype, you're 100% right in the West, typically from those that I've come around, and they're usually extremely uh, conservative types, politically speaking, that kind of view Muslims like, mm, mm, there's that Muslim, the towel head. They'll use terms like that. They'll use really derogatory verbiage towards people. And it's really bad. It's really, really, really bad because every time I have learned in my life experience, when I've encountered or been offered to come over to eat dinner with Muslims, I am like walking away going, these people are saints. These are some of the nicest people I have ever met in my life. I'm not making this up. The guy that I helped who was struggling with addiction, his mother, I felt like was like my mother. I went to New York to pick him up and help him get clean. And he's a Muslim. His whole family is Muslim. His brothers, all of them. But his mom was suffering so bad from the addiction of her son, the oldest son. I'm not going to name names just in case they ever come across this video. But they are some of the nicest people I have ever met. 
they would have gave their shirt off their back to help me if I needed it. They would have done anything to help me. And I'm thinking, wow, all we need to do is meet more Muslims, talk to Muslims, don't debate with Muslims, try to just know who they are. Hey, what are your activities? Create friendships. Don't talk about politics or religion with them if you can. Get to know them first. And then once you guys have that kind of relationship, maybe the conversation can happen. But too often, it's this tribalism online, and it's these people and stuff like that. And man, like even I'm sure there's stuff deep inside of me from my upbringing and my life that I have to purge. I have to learn to get out and I have to grow up. And that's why I'm learning every day, trying to talk to them. And I hope that people are, um, that are watching this as well, are trying to have those interfaith dialogues, have those friendships that are outside of your atheist community or your skeptical community or your Christian community or your Muslim community. This is important that we have these things. If we're going to make changes, I honestly think that's necessary. Great question or Great statement, Rational Mind. I really appreciate that. Rainbow Krampus. YouTube auto mod makes this hard to say smoothly. Don't apologize for Islam. Be caring for Muslims. Okay. Don't apologize for Islam. Be caring for Muslims. Well, that's like saying, yeah. I mean, would I apologize for Christianity? No. Be caring for Muslims. Be caring for Christians, be caring for Jews. But I'd also say I know versions of Christianity that aren't as ugly as what I came out of, as cultic as what I came out of. And man, what I came out of was a cult. So you're right. You're right. But I'm also very care careful. Do I need to add the caveat? Well, there are forms of Islam. Or, well, there are forms of Christianity. No, but. If I'm going to educate properly or try to give the why I think this is necessary, I feel that it's necessary to add that caveat because we assume Islam is monolithic. Islam itself is not, and neither is Christianity, neither is Judaism, neither is any of these Abrahamic faiths, though there are horrible things that come from all three that we really should be careful about. It's that fine line between anti-Semitism and anti-Jewishness. And being critical of, of the God of the Bible or Jewish practices or things like that, or even bigoted Jews that are out there in the world. There are bigoted Jews, but I know so many Jews who aren't. And so it's like, okay, hold up. It's very, very difficult because people identify with the religion a lot of times. And if you go to be critical of their religion, they think you're being critical of them. I think the early chat we had in this live stream when Seb was saying, Seb Oz, I think it was, was saying it's racist what she did by bringing on this picture, I'm like, mm, that doesn't compute for me. It would have been racist if there was something eth like ethnically related or there was something that was trying to purposely jab a people group or something. No, none of that. All she was doing was showing you what Muslims drew, the art of Muslims in the 14th century. And she was going through an art class that covers art from all history and cultures and stuff. If anything, that's going to defang bad ideas educating more people on this stuff. So what the, what the, what the uh, college did was wrong. But I, I just feel like if we just only criticize and say, Oh, Islam, don't apologize for Islam. I get what you're saying, but I'm also learning Islam is not one thing. And it's, it's, it's the same thing with Christianity. So it's complicated. And yes, I keep adding that caveat. Maybe you're trying to correct me on it and forgive me if I repeat it. I think it's necessary. Thank you so much, Rainbow. I appreciate that super chat. I do agree with it, but I, I also want to be careful to point that out because if I'm going to help progress and push good ideas forward, I want to get people who have similar ethical concerns, similar um, goals in educating people to not think in horrible ways and not think that Al-Qaeda is the actual accurate proper view of Islam, mm, let's let's like make sure that people don't become Al-Qaeda. Let's try to help the world in a more progressive view. Even if I think that Allah doesn't exist, even if I don't think that these things really happened or these miracles or whatever it might be, I want people to behave and go in a better direction so I could find common ground with people who are going to be speaking that way. That's my goal. That's my goal.
A Anonymous, Anonymous. What the heck am I doing? I'm over here like breaking down Anonymous. Again, good to see you in the chat. Discuss Islam and LGBT rights. Well, this is a very, very controversial issue. Most of, from what I understand, most Muslims are obviously, it's inherent in their particular tradition to be against this idea of people of same sex, of uh, gender fluid, fluidity, all of these things. And I know some Muslims in the West that are actually, they are progressive. They are more liberal on this approach. And they don't listen to Muslims through history to try and understand their religion. I think Quranist only Muslims are people of, of an example that would try. Uh, and I don't know. I can't read their minds. But I know there are extreme groups that would want gays dead. Uh, and that's horrible. We need to eradicate these ideas, honestly, I feel. And the way you do that isn't by sword. You do that by education and teaching people and keeping people, I think, meeting other people too, like becoming and befriending people who have those opposing identities or beliefs. And that would be my encouragement. While I've been telling everyone in the live chat, meet a Muslim, become a friend of a Muslim, learn about them, that kind of thing. I'm speaking also to Muslims, meet people who are LGBTQ, become friends with them, understand them and why they do that, what they do or why they are who they are. And that might help with your empathy. For me, I'm going to make this a personal thing. When I was a Reformed Calvinist, I believe that God predestined everyone for heaven or hell before they were born. This is my interpretation. I know it's ugly because it really can get ugly when you think about it. But when I started to think about family and friends that I loved, and I thought, my God has some of these people destined to burn for all eternity. And I really had this like moment while I was still a very strong believer in this faith. I thought, can I love more than God? Like God can't love them because it says, Jacob, I loved Esau. I hate it. I went with the text, right? God doesn't love them. That's why they're going to hell. And he loves those he, he saves. He actively was involved in making sure that people get saved. He's the potter and you're the clay. That's how I understood it. And it really dawned on me for a moment, and then I had to put it down in my mind. I had to suppress it. Do I love people more than God loves them? Some people, not all, but some people more than God loves them. Because I love these people, and if their actions and behaviors, in my point of view, cause them to go to hell or are going to make them burn, um, we got a problem. Because I personally, ethically, I can't not love these people. And... I couldn't imagine. It was a very di cognitive dissonance moment in my in my mind. And if you're friends with people that are outside of your group that are living a lifestyle, a way that in which your particular belief system is that way, can you really imagine your God doing that to them? And it's something to think about. But it's also something to think about. Can I change my views about what God, what I think God will do to people? And I hope people do that. I think many Christians, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I have. Many Christians are becoming universalist lately online. They are becoming it because they're confronted with the ugliness of hell. Let's just call it what it is. And they're finding evidence for what could be interpreted in a universal way, certain ideas. Um, in the end, Christ will be all in all. And early church fathers interpreted it this way. Other early church fathers couldn't wait to tell you how God was going to destroy the unbeliever. And if we did a social historical research, I wonder if those people who hoped God was going to burn them in hell were going through extreme situations in their own life, persecution, or they were treated bad or whatever. But I wonder if people like Origen kind of had it made. And they were in a, in a good advantage. So they had a life that projected through their writings of a universal salvation for everyone in a delightful message rather than this bad one. I think about the writings of certain Jewish authors in the Zohar and, um, you know, there's some stuff that's anti-Gentile. But when you find out the historical setting of how the Christian church, the Gentiles, literally persecuted and were forced converting Jews and all of this stuff in their, in their little pockets— no wonder they had a hate toward them. And now you can see why their ugly handwriting toward Gentiles is seen. So this is why I love doing historical research. Um, anonymous, 
Thank you for the support. Really appreciate it. Far sight. Again, thank you. Most people are good people, religious or not. Can we get a round of applause? Hallelujah. Seriously, I agree with that. I have been saying this. This is why I'm a secular atheist humanist. I have a model. I believe in something. I believe in humans. I believe in my experience. I believe in me. I believe in my family. I believe in the ones that are around me. And I do think that humans are ethically getting better. We're trying to get better. And we need to do that as a group. We need to try and do that more and more. But I definitely think that if you have a dated model, some of the things that are in religion can bring the worst out of us. And while we're humans, we are from the animal kingdom. We have evolved to where we are today. And if you look at how the tribalism works with the, an with the animal kingdom, you could see that happening in humanity. Look at the wars. We're just repeating what has happened over and over due to tribalistic ideas and things like that. How, and I don't know the answer to this, how do we overcome? How can we as humans ever end war? I know it sounds like wishful thinking, but I asked this a long time ago. When can we finally let our ideas not cause us to kill each other? in our practices. When can we, how can we, and when can we make that happen? I would love to see a world like that. Anyway, um, thank you Farsight for that super chat. Really do appreciate it. Going to the next inquisitive mind. Do you think Muhammad was turning in grave whenever you brought on Hoyland, Shoemaker, Anthony, Van Putin, Sidke, Howard Johnson, Saeed Reynolds, etc.? Uh, I don't know what, <laughs> this is an interesting question. It's like, would Jesus be rolling over? Is he rolling over in his grave? And of course, Christians would say he's not in the grave. Um, but I don't think that's the case. And I do think there was probably a guy, if he knew that Christians were worshiping him and his mom, I mean, using like Catholicism, some form of worship, but like, let's just say that happened. Would he be okay with that? No. But here, let me let me turn it around, inquisitive. If if Muhammad would have seen what Muslims did with his message, would he be turning in his grave? What would he think about the Shiite Sunni split? You know, hypotheticals. These are all hypotheticals. But asking the question, do you think Muhammad was turning in his grave by my interviews with Hoyland Shoemaker? I don't know. Because I don't know what kind of prophet figure, or another way to put it, cult type figure, leader of the certain sect and group that he's teaching. I don't know what kind of person he actually was, but I don't imagine that he would be, if he's trying to convert, let's just say the Quran is accurate in portraying him as trying to convert people and get them to come over. I can't imagine he would be friends with me. I don't know though. I don't know. It's so hypothetical and so interesting because I would want to try, but I don't know if if he's the kind of person who would have done that. Don't know. Um, Muslims in the chat might have something to say. Like, how would he feel about critical Western scholarship and the stuff that I brought on? What are your thoughts as a Muslim? And then what are your thoughts? Do you think he's rolling over in his grave hy hypothetically inquisitive? Because I really couldn't answer the question. I couldn't. I imagine some Muslims definitely don't like my channel because of the critical stuff we do and the historical research, but, you know, I don't know. Seth, hi. I am a former Muslim. I was an agnostic searching one. The best defense against the constraints of Islam, like not showing his image, is to show his image or else you expand their censorship. Good point. I am absolutely pro art here. I am pro the image and I'm, I am pro people's right to express their own critiques and um, issues with the religion itself and whatnot. I ask that people try to be better with the humans that are participants in these religions. I ask that we're able to do that more, but I also agree. I think that if we are able to educate what, let me put it this way. I'm going to stop myself and say this, what that college did by suppressing this academic in the art Institute of their, you know, college, honestly, actually made things worse. And it, they're not helping to 
educate and promote more free thinking, free education, getting culture out there. Because as I've studied more about Islam, and I am far from exhausting any of this research, I have literally just begun. But as I've studied, I have become more sympathetic and empathetic on understanding the culture and the history that is there. There is a huge chasm between the West and the way we think and what is in the Middle East. Huge chasm. And we need to try and bridge that gap somehow. So by suppressing educating people on 14th century art that depicts Muhammad, what in the world? It's not like she went up there and said, all right, here's, you know, Salman Rushdie, um, literally trying to mock and scoff, even though I think he has the right to do so and should not be attacked for it. Criticized all day long, freedom of speech. Attacked violently, that's that's a tough one. He might, there might be people who feel that way, but that's also showing you that the person who identifies with the religion so much that they're willing to kill people for it, that's scary. Don't criticize the religion or you get killed. Whoa. We need more freedom to speak, freedom of religion, and freedom to criticize it as well. Seth, great super chat, and thank you. I don't want to expand censorship. I want to expand more, more freedom and understanding why this would have been better to allow rather than censor. Scrolling down to the next super, Max the Confessor, is Islam necessary and iconic? Why don't iconodules have you say hold on I, I i gotta look this word up i've never even heard of this word and i think icon meaning image so let me look up an iconic uh, an iconic definition and me meaning without idols or images opposed to the use of idols or images and an iconic religion Sym uh, symbolic or suggestive rather than literally representational, not made or designed as a likeness. So is Islam, is Islam necessarily an iconic? That's why I said the art that this lady gets fired for was done by Muslims. Now they weren't from the Sunni um, perspective. They're from the Shia side, from what I understand, but Muslims nonetheless felt that it was okay. And then you said, uh, why don't iconodules have a say? Let me look that word up. Iconodules. These big old words. So um, a person who supports the veneration or of religious I icons and iconophile or icon iconodulist um, so this is a person who I think is okay with the idea. So why don't, yeah, that's a great point. So I had to literally Webster dictionary, your super chat, Max, the confessor, cause you kicked my butt. You literally kicked my butt with that one. I knew iconic meaning image, but I, I wanted to understand what you were trying to do with that. So, um, I think that this is the point. There are voices from the Muslim world who thought what happened was wrong. And I put that it's the first link in the description of the statement of support for art professor fired from Hamlin University by impact. And my friend Javad Hashmi, Muslim scholar, he said, we immediately, when this happened, opposed what the university did and asked that they reverse what they did. Hint, hint, these are Muslims. And these are kind that I will back up and I will get behind. And that is what I'm trying to point out. So important that when we talk about Islam, well, these are Muslims, which means they follow Islam. So they have a certain form of Islam that isn't the same kind of form of Islam that some would do, say, thank you, university, for firing this lady for doing such a horrible thing. Can you imagine how far that would take us down the rabbit hole if you start opening up the door of well, we don't want you. you can, my religion says I can't see a crucifix because Jesus is God and God can't depict it in images. And I see Jesus as God. So don't even make an image of Jesus. Will the university then draw the line and say you can't have any images of art of Christianity or Jesus because they see Jesus as God and God is not able to be made in any graven image at all? 
how far is one willing to go? Now, maybe Muslims don't care, and they're like, oh, who cares? I don't care about that art. Sure, devoid the earth of any art, any images at this point. How far do you want to go? No. So I am with uh, this Muslim scholar and impact on this idea. William Ahrens, good to see you in the chat. I was this. I, I think you're saying, I'm troubled that the USA and its allies deserted the more secular and rational Afghans in 2021 and let the fundamentalist Taliban back in power. See, I don't know much about the political struggle here. I do know that the West has helped in light of what happened with Russia. I was in 2010, I went to Afghanistan. I was in Bagram, Afghanistan in 2010. Uh, as a contractor, I was a well, pretty much a mailman on base there. And I saw various armies when we went to the chow hall, as they call it, or the little cafeteria. You see different armies from different nations, from France to Russia, you name it. But that base was a Russian military base. And the West armed militant groups that were radicalized, I think, by the propaganda, according to what I heard, making them more militant. And these very radical groups ended up turning against the West. And of course, against the region. So yeah, you can blame the West for a lot of what's happened over there in the Middle East. You can blame us. I think we should. Being fair. William Arns, thank you so much for the super chat. Seth High, the other tactic is to show the ridiculousness of control and censorship. Example, according to Islam, I am an apostate that needs to be killed. Who will cast the, who will cast the first stone? So Seth, this is a great, great point. You're an apostate. I was reading in yesterday, I was reading the book before I interviewed Dr. Gabriel Saeed Reynolds, and I'm looking forward to being able to release that. Um, that's going to be a good one. In his book, he brings up how, yes, there are Muslims who think this, but other forms of Islam don't. That's the interesting thing. So I don't know if this is like a majority count in Sunni Islam that they think you should be killed, but not all Muslims in their forms of Islam think this. And in fact, guess where this comes from? Later biographers and people who write hadith and such, they're the ones who implement this idea of you know killing you. Um, and they're interpreting certain Quranic passages in light of this kind of thing. So uh, you can read stories about Muhammad that are just not nice, that are very, very bad about this. And um, did Muhammad actually do it or not? I don't know. If he did, he was a man of his time, of course. Um, if he didn't, he was resisting probably the urges of his time. I don't know. Very interesting super chat. But I also am a friend of Ridven, who is apostate prophet. I know that he's very critical I feel really bad the kind of criticism he gets. He puts himself in that position, right, to go and be critical. Um, but I'm also friends of many ex-Muslims, and they're in a tough, tough spot because they get a lot of hate from the Dawah gang, as you can call them, on the internet. And I know Muslims that don't think that. And I feel this is my little critique of the ex-Muslim community that I hope they do is to try and befriend the people who are not against that, that's, or sorry, that are against the, the, the death threats, the ideas of you needing to die. Befriend the people who have a similar ethic of saying, hey, we respect you even if we don't agree with your conclusions. And in no way should you deserve to die. I think the change is going to happen from the inside. Rome fell from the inside. I think the change within Christianity happened from the inside. Look at the slavery issue, right? There were Southern slave owners, Christians, using their Bible to prove, hey, I can own people, and this is justified and good. And people in the North, nope, and it wasn't just North and South, but there's a variation there. But the point is, Christians amongst themselves had this issue. And it were Christians that were rising up against Christians to do this. We need more Muslims who are able to rise up and make a change within their own communities. Seth, I uh, really appreciate your super chat. And it's interesting. I didn't know that you were, uh, I guess, an apostate in particular uh, with Islam. I didn't know you were ex-Muslim. Thank you for that. Scrolling down, scrolling down. Trying to make sure we cover what we're supposed to... Uh, 
Omar in the chat says, uh, Mythfish Maga, hello, Derek. I hope you're well, man. Did you get a chance to read the emails I sent you months ago? I must be honest, Omar. I have not read them all. Like, I literally just read that you sent me some stuff. I started reading, and I can't even remember the context. I'm working my life away right now, man. I'm trying my best. I'm sorry. Um, if you feel like resending them, feel free to. I must admit that I don't even know if I'll have time to really dig into them because I'm actually putting some courses together and I'm always doing some tough work. And it's hard to get me on when I'm doing certain topics. So um, I apologize. Must got I got to keep it real with you. I haven't read them completely. I know that you sent me some stuff and I remember starting to read some of them, but I definitely didn't read them all. Stop scamming, man. Among non-Muslims in the West, there's a fair bit of energy put towards defending Islam from attack and insult that would have been better spent making a stand against the Muslim genocide in China. Interesting. Wow. I did not know that there was this Muslim genocide in China going on. See, I don't even have my ears to the ground. I, I'm not aware of so much that does go on. I think I did hear in passing something like that, but I also see there's a co there's constant persecution of Christians in China too, from what I understand. So it wouldn't shock me. I agree. Islam as a religion being defended, I mean, maybe there's a context in which that could be made, but definitely I would say watching out for Muslims is another thing. So the person and the belief or the religion itself they're two different categories to me, even if they overlap sometimes. I think it's important that we differentiate. And being critical of Islam is a necessary component of critical thinking of the scientific method of the West and what we do. It was Christians. If you haven't watched my course with Delcy Allison Jr. on the quest for the historical Jesus, where have you been? You really need to sign up for that course. It's not a course about proving Jesus' historicity. It's not a course about disproving. It is not an apologetic course. It is a history from the Protestant Reformation on what Christians did to the other Christians. By the way, they were priests in the Catholic Church that were opposing other Catholic ideologies and their own faith. They ended up starting to break off when we had a break. Protestantism out of, they were protesting, of the Catholic Church. And then down through the history, from the Protestant Reformation down, it was Christians, not atheists, not skeptics, not, you know, whatever you want to call people who aren't Christians, okay? It was Christians who saw the problems with their own Bibles. It was Christians who saw textual variants. Christians who said, Jesus didn't say that. Christians who said, New Testament gospels are mythology and legend, and that well, there's some meaning there. They didn't literally happen. These were Christians. So I feel like it's going to be Muslims who are going to be critical of Islam, who are going to be critical of the history of Islam, who are going to be critical of current contemporary Islam, and we need to empower those Muslims to help make a change in Islam. And that's my personal take. Too often it's either or, and I think we need to find a way. That's my voice, and that's what I get from this, but I had no clue that there was um, genocide in China happening to Muslims. That's wild. Thank you for that. Stop scamming, man. I always love seeing you in this chat. It really is good to see all of you in support, throwing super chats and stuff. I hope you guys are, are all enjoying these uh, these times in 2023. We're going to have a heck of a year here at Myth Vision. I've got so much work I'm doing. It's unreal. In fact, to tease you, if you haven't joined the Patreon, join. There's 164 people watching. It's $3 a month. It won't kill your bank. I have Dr. Kip Davis coming in a few weeks. We're about to do ancient real ancient Israelite religion, something like that we're titling it. And it's the evidence of the ancient Israelite religion. We're going through doing a whole course, right? But while he's here, I'm going to be recording videos with him, taking one question at a time, meaning one Patreon member asks a question of Dr. Kip Davis, Dead Sea Scroll scholar and Hebrew Bible scholar. He knows the ancient Israelite religion, all of that, which he's going to be using this information, which he's taught before at like universities and stuff. And I'm going to be asking your question in 4K. You can help and you also get 
video, a whole video. Think about what I'm saying here. You have your own 4K video where your question is asked and it's all about your question recorded. The video might end up five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Don't know how long Kip has to go on it, but it's, I mean, this is something I offer here. So I really do appreciate the support and I appreciate you stop skimming in. All the super chats really help. Paul Kickling again, but everyone is saved. It is your fallen half that goes to Hades, Hades, and the divine spark goes to the platonic world. You are crucified, i.e. saved from dualism. <laughs> we have a Gnostic in the chat. I really appreciate the support. It's interesting. I mean, that's an optimistic outlook, right? That technically everybody ends up going to the same place. Really, really appreciate it. Um. Uh, Baybar says the Muslim apologist, those are Ottoman paintings. I don't know. I'm in the middle of a conversation there. Just, just recognizing you Baybar. Cause I saw you in the discussion the other night far sight. I think that if there was a God, they would have wanted to be able to convince even a critical scholar, not just a bronze age peasant. There's a lot to be said about this. I don't know if peasants the right term, because I think my thoughts I think that Muhammad was more educated than we give him credit for. Um, there's a way of kind of an apologetic in a way, in my opinion, on trying to say he didn't know these passages, on trying to say he didn't know these oral traditions and learned them from Christians or even from his own upbringing in the region. We now know that Christianity was well known at this time in Arabia. So I think he was more educated than we give him credit for. One might even argue Jesus was more uh, educated than Lots of scholars give him credit for. They think he was illiterate and he didn't know much and couldn't speak more than one language. Who knows? We don't know. But um, it's, I, I had to highlight that. But the point is, is I agree with you that you would imagine this would happen. And what I hear apologetics that come out is, well, God spoke to them at that time with that message. And when I mentioned that God evolved, where is the book? My favorite book in the world, God and Anatomy. You all know, I always bring it up, God and Anatomy. In that book, God has body parts. God is physical. God is not like this invisible, spiritual, outside space and time thing that philosophy makes God. God is active, physical, has children, had a wife, has body parts, all of that. And that's what Francesca shows. It evolves over time. So the apologetic is, well, maybe divine revelation gets revealed over time. And so humans only at that time needed to have it. What's more plausible? I think Farsight would agree with me is that this looks very natural and an evolution of ideas, meaning humans' perception is changing over time. Therefore, the perception of what we call God changes. It doesn't disprove that there isn't something of a creator. It just says that this revelation was dated. And that's it. But um, in Islam, you know, you have debate even among Muslims about God and body parts, having a hand or sitting on a throne or things like that. There are variations. I think most of them will say immaterial, unknowable. Obviously, the Quran talks about there are no sons. God is no father. Uh, don't even try to lower him into a category that can be like that. It's almost unimaginable what God is. And so um, that is their perception, it seems, for some, right? I don't know if all, but I think that that's pretty much perception. It sounds very philosophical, which makes me wonder, did Muhammad also have an awareness of philosophy uh, at the time, Greek philosophy? It seems the Quran is aware of the debate amongst Christians. And um, yeah, so anyway, that's my thoughts. I don't know why I took your super chat that direction. I hope that you didn't mind Farsight. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Paul Kickling again in the house. Paul, thank you. Wrath in Judaism, Christianity is the same in Buddhism. So you can be crucified. Otherwise, you will never learn what you did wrong and thus never grow. It's karma. I think that uh, Robert Price has said before on the channel that there are many hells to, uh, to Buddhism. There are many hells and things like that. So it's similar language. And you wonder, 
are you right? Is this the kind of understanding? Take up your cross and follow me. Does Jesus mean literally take up your cross and follow me? I tend to think so. But then again, I'm reading Mark through a context of as a poor uh, post-war document. And I think that the Jerusalem sect got killed in this war. And there is a reason that Mark portrays them in this way, that they didn't, Jesus died alone, forsaken. And uh, so I have I have an angle on this where I think he's trying to say, well, if you guys would have died for my sake here, you would have took up your cross and followed me. Instead, they forsook him. And that's why the women fled from the tomb and told no one about Jesus and where he went. So Matthew has to fix it, of course. Matthew's like, oh, hell no. We got to make Jesus look better than that. Um, so they do. And Luke fixes that and then paints him in a Socrates manner at his death where he fears no death and feels no pain and he's noble. Um, thank you again, Paul, for that super chat. really appreciate it. Bringing in different ideas. Seth High is back. And am I saying that right? I feel like I'm saying high. Is it high or he? Don't know. All three monotheistic religions are very controlling. Jesus' basic message was to live the kingdom of God within yourself and to simply not be so controlling about the rules. Smart dude. This depends on the interpretation of Jesus' message of the kingdom. Because if you take it in the Gospel of Mark, spoke to um, recently with James Tabor and other academics who think Mark is actually um, showing the Jewish perspective of the kingdom. Like this is a real expectation of the real thing that's supposed to come in. They expect the end to happen. 70 AD is a sign of it, but it doesn't happen. It's Luke that you see the kingdom of God is in you. And so you wonder if this is cognitive dissonance explaining a spiritualization of a false or a felled happening of the kingdom, or is Mark spiritual like Luke uh, out the gate? There's debate on this. I tend to think that the apocalypticism and eschatology of the kingdom fitting Jesus within his Jewish context of other Jewish thinking, that seems to be the most likely to me is that the kingdom gets changed to a spiritual one, not literal, earthly. I mean, you kind of see this literal earthly even in Revelation. It's highly symbolic and it's got all the stuff, but it talks about the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And if you read the Lord's Prayer on earth as it is in heaven, it's almost like, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They're hoping that that God will step in and change history. Get the bad guy off the throne. Give justice to those who've been done wrong. You know, the meek will inherit the earth. I haven't seen them inherit nothing. So when will that happen? Anyway, th this is my point. I think there's more of a practical approach to the kingdom. One can, can interpret it through Luke's lens, but I think we're doing it wrong if we do that. I think there's a reason Luke comes later using Mark and changes it. Thanks, Seth. Appreciate the super chat. Appreciate that. Uh, look, so uh, Metalhead says, Taliban are true Muslims. Survival of the fittest always win, and they got the guns. So I, I think that all Muslims who are trying to identify as Muslims would in some way say they're Muslims. But this is the same thing. Are are Mormons Christians? Are Jehovah's Witnesses Christians? I'd say yes. They're obviously not Orthodox, but Catholics are Christians, Eastern Orthodox are Christians, Protestants are Christians. The list goes on. They're all claiming to be Christians. There are certain Gnostics who claim to be Christian. Are they Christian? I think so. So it's like this category can be, it's very vague and, and it's got a, a spectrum umbrella here. But notice how quick a Christian is ready to call a Christian not a Christian. And that's why I loved Elaine Pagel's book, The Origins of Satan. And she shows the, the in-group tribalism amongst themselves. Nobody thinks others are not Christians more than Christians. And if you look at the debate and arguments among Muslims, look how quick Muslims attack Muslims. You're not a true Muslim. You, you know, you're not tr the true message of Islam. To, you know, it's the same thing. And it happens and it never, it's like it never ends. Had to stop and just give you a highlight there and notice that. Would you talk to Dr. Khalil Andani on uh, Ishmaelism? Max the Confessor 
Absolutely. In fact, I've already been in conversation. We just haven't made it happen yet with Dr. Khalil Andani. And I want to know, he knows a lot about the Shia Sunni split. So while I know he has, he's sympathetic to certain understandings, he knows how historical methodology works. He understands how to approach this as a scholar. And I want to get a scholar's take an academic take using historical methodology on what he's discovered and what, why he, you know, what, what is the, the ordeal without getting into favoring one side or the other? I'm curious to know the historical precedents for it. So Max, thank you for that super chat. Appreciate you. Your name is chiseled in the Lambert's book of life. I wrote the book and you'll be in there. So thank you. <laughs> um, Omar says, I agree, Derek, we need to fix the one in the mirror before trying to help others. Well put Omar. I love the mirror. Uh, the mirror analogy is something I use a lot in my own life too. So seriously. Scrolling down, I see that we have a super chat. I'm trying to find Doc Pleroma not in the house. We got a scholar on our hands. Doc, it's good to see you. Uh, Happy New Year, Big D. Keep, keep stream roll, steam rolling, my friend. I am. Someone's like, be careful burning out. I'm like, I don't think I know how to. <laughs> I don't think I know how to burn out because I love what I do. It may be hard. And yes, I struggle and I get tired and I'm worn out a lot, but I love learning and studying and diving into this stuff. And I am just a student, but I've been learning a lot, but I am a student and I love to be flexible and learn new ideas. That's exactly what the scholars do too, right? So in Islam, we have Stephen J. Shoemaker who has arguments. I want his views. We have Hoyland, who disagrees with Shoemaker on some stuff, but agrees with him on some stuff. I want his views. I wish Pat Patricia Crone was alive. I would have interviewed the heck out of her. She would have had no choice but to interview with me. I'd have flown to her and done in person and everything. But um, I appreciate the super chat, Doc. I'm going to keep rolling. I've got Kip Davis coming. Um, so, you know, you're on the Patreon, so feel free to ask a question. He's the Dead Sea Scroll scholar and Hebrew Bible scholar. Um, Next month, I'm going to interview Robin Faith Walsh. We're doing a couple of recordings there. That's going to be amazing. One is going to be on the Gospels because she has her unique origins of Christian literature book that she talked about. And then also the Apostle Paul, which she's an expert on. And I'm going to be interviewing her in person, high quality, 4K, be on the lookout. Um, I've got stuff coming. We're doing, we're doing it. It's going to happen 2023. Thanks for the support and the uh, the praise. I'm gonna keep steamrolling. Garrett Nar is it Nar Nariez Nargez? Forgive me for butchering that. I bet I'm currently a student at Hamlin. Oh snap! Okay, here we go. This is good. I'm glad to see you in the chat. I'm currently a student at Hamlin. That is the university that the professor was fired from for this debacle. Masters in education. As a future educator and atheist, I find the outcome at my school to be quite concerning. Me too. And I hope that they that they reverse what happens. I won't even look. It's a learning experience. I wouldn't hold this sin against the university, you know, indefinitely, unless they don't do something about it. But at the end of the day, I'm absolutely with you, Garrett. I really appreciate you coming in as somebody who's there. This is a big concerning issue, and that's why I brought up Impact's article from a Muslim. Muslims, actually, the, the, this Impact article is, and it's showing like, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous, and they're calling for a reversal. So let's hope that your university, Hamlin, reverses what happened and makes things right, compensates her for the shaming and things like that that happened here because it's 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 pretty bad. Um. I really appreciate that. I'd love to hear anything that you might know that I don't about this situation, but let's just hope that it does change, especially being someone in a secular university in the West. Holy smokes, right? Mm. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. And I'm like highlighting the voices of Muslims that are saying, hey, um, you need to change this. The ones who say, no, thank you, university. Eh, nah, dude, not having it. So I really, really, really want to make that change as well. Garrett, thank you for the super chat. Stop scamming, man. Ibn Ishaq's 8th century bio of Muhammad has a, 
whole bunch of references to Muhammad reading and writing. Hmm. Numerous Muslims, including Muhammad's daughter, Ruqayya, spent time in Christian Ab Abyssinia. Wow. Okay. So I've been hearing some apologetics online, Stop Scamming Man, where they're trying to say he's illiterate and doesn't know how to read or write, that he just a prophet who's got the words directly from Gabriel in a cave. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm approaching this critically, right? I want to know what really happened and not the, the faith commitments. Just like if the faith commitments of Christianity is that Jesus crucified, was buried, and rose again from the dead, there are many Muslims who would say, I'm not saying all, because I know that that passage in, is it Surah 5 something, I could be wrong about the location in the Quran, but it specifically sounds like maybe Jesus didn't get crucified. Some have interpreted it that way. And uh, it's like, well, hold on. Are you going to accept that he was crucified and was buried and actually rose from the dead? Well, no, we don't We don't believe he died and rose from the dead. Oh, but Christians do. So you don't follow their faith commitments to conclude that, that position. And this is interesting that a bio has him reading and writing. I need the source, of course, to double check if you're right about this. But I'm saying it wouldn't shock me one bit. But if you don't want Muhammad having read Christian literature or read Jewish literature or was writing and reading or was aware, collaborating with people, learning this material, then you might come up with an apologetic like that. But as Gabriel Saeed Reynolds' book recently, Emergence of Islam, I keep mentioning it, and I have an interview coming out, he says in his book that uh, the Quran is speaking to a people who already know all of the, sto the stories of these people. Jonah, Abraham, Adam, Moses, Joshua, like they already know Mary and Jesus big time. This community that the Quran is being written to is clearly aware of all of this stuff. It isn't this absolute dark age of paganism. And it's like, hey, we're going to introduce you to this guy named Adam and Moses and Abraham. You don't even know who they are. So let me give you the context. No, they already know this stuff. So that means the teachings of Jesus and and uh, Jewish thought and stuff is down there in Arabia, wherever this is taking place at. Thank you, Stop Scamming Man. I appreciate that. Always, always appreciate you in the chat. <laughs> Seriously, uh, always bringing in some insight. Again, stop scamming, man. The main victims of China's atrocities against Muslims in China are the uh, we Uyghurs. The Uyghurs? Uyghurs? I'm just trying to pronounce because you say pronounce. Thank you for helping me. You're one of the few people in the world who actually helps me to pronounce something. Uh, Uyghurs. Millions are incarcerated and worse. Millions? Hold on. Millions? That's wild. Wow. That's wild. I did not know that. Thank you uh, for bringing that to my attention. Now you got me wanting to go look up what's going on in China. So crazy. Thank you. Stop skimming, man. Again, inquisitive mind. Robin Faith Walsh needs dating. Link me up, Derek. She is a married woman, my friend. But I do have a funny, um, I have a very funny tell to tell you. I actually was speaking to her earlier today on the phone. And, um, when you search, so when I create YouTube videos, down in the bottom of the YouTube videos, there's tags. And when you type in tag words, keywords, right? They're like hashtags. Um, sometimes I have an automated thing that like lets me know certain things that are popular known tags. And one of the most popular tags when you just type in, type in Robin Faith Walsh is the next word comes up, husband. So... People on the internet, you can blame yourselves, YouTube, are searching Robin Faith Walsh husband. <laughs> she had a crack. She laughed at it. She's like, oh my gosh, that's wild. But um, appreciate that support, man. The ghost of myth vision. Thank you. Stop scamming, man. Again, Muhammad's first wife had a cousin named uh, Waraka, Waraka, described as a Christian scholar. Later hadith say he died shortly after his first vision, but Ibn Ashaq's earlier work has him living till years later. When the Muslim voices don't agree, right? I know that there's a way I'm sure Muslims will say the earlier material probably is more accurate depending on the person. But uh, I don't know what to what to make of some of these later biographies. As I'm finding out from a lot of these scholars, you got to be very careful 
not to throw them completely away. You want to have them as a possible way of assessing historical information, but big grains of salt need to be sprinkled on this material as you're reading it because what is the motivation oftentimes? When I asked him about the satanic verses, right, there are some scholars who think this goes back because you find the three cranes or the names of these goddesses in the Quran. But according to, you're going to see the interview, some scholars actually say, no, I think this was actually created um, and it's not historical, doesn't go back to Muhammad. And they have valid arguments for and against. Both sides have valid arguments for and against as to why they draw the conclusions that they do. And so what it, it, it doesn't hurt me any. It, to me, it actually makes it even more clear, like the confusion in this isn't so clear cut. And for me as a skeptic, like this is bringing up many more reasons to doubt your your fundamentalist faith that you think this is the truth and all is wrong and false. To me, it just weakens that strength that, I mean, I've said this before, like out the gate, read after the Muhammad, or after the prophet, and it's talking about Muhammad's death and those after. Look at how quickly, according to the narrations of biographers and such, how quickly the internal battle, family feuds, disagreements, interpretive issues, leadership, all this stuff. Like who was supposed to follow um, Muhammad in leadership? Did he leave anyone in charge? This is a debate, right? In, in issues that go on. Uh, was it supposed to be Ali or what happened here? Like I, as a skeptic who was never a believer, approach this and go, this sounds very human to me. And so these are my thoughts. And I think that Stop Scamming Man, you would agree with me on this, that it just, it creates an environment that is a big red flag to me. I see it with Christianity. I've already seen it with Judaism and Christianity, and I see these various voices that can't agree, all these problems. It doesn't debunk anything ultimately. It just makes huge red flags of doubt. Like, can I really trust your message and what you're teaching here? Um, anyway, my thoughts. Stop Scamming Man, appreciate the support. Again, Max the Confessor is in the house. Off topic, have you gone through Clement of Alexandria saying Plato prophesied the crucifixion? He had a copy of the Republic that talked about a hated, perf perfect man who was crucified in a thought experiment. What? I have never heard of that. Can you email me a source on this? I have never heard of this. And it might be a later thing that people are putting in the mouth of Plato, but I'd be shocked to see a source that's actually early. And this isn't something that, especially like Richard Carrier and others, wouldn't have capitalized on. I don't know. Please um, email me if you don't have that. I'm putting it in the chat. All right, there's my email. Please feel free to message me any sources you find on that, or even the idea, if you know where anywhere I can look to find that. That's wild, Max. I really appreciate you bringing that to my attention, but that's that's like, once again, we're looking for history. We're trying to find out what's up. What I want to know when this was dated and when this was said. Paul Kickling, go to the wiki page of Teaching of Jacob, earliest mention of Islam. It says, original Islam was a Christian heresy in 9th century Abbasid edit, edited the Quran. Teaching of Jacob. Let me look at this here. T, uh, Wiki teaching of Jacob. All right. Uh, room's getting kind of dark, so I'm going to brighten my face a little so people can see me better. Here we go. Let's do this here. The teaching of Jacob. Um, uh, Doctrina Jacobi, Ethiopic, has a controversial dating in the early 7th century to the 8th century, a Greek Christian polemical tract supposedly set in Carthage in 634, but written in Palestine sometime between 634 and 640. It supposedly records a oops, excuse me, a weeks-long discussion ending in July 13th, 634, among Jews who have been forcibly baptized by order of the emperor, one of them, Jacob, has come to believe sincerely in Christianity. He instructs the rest about, I don't know... So this teaching of Jacob, I'm curious if you had any source specifically that says something like this, because I've actually gone to this um, 
to point out a conversation with me and Sean Anthony. He uses it in his book on the historical Muhammad, but I don't know of any, I mean, it wouldn't shock me if they were a form of Christianity. That's, that's for sure. It would not shock me a bit that they were some form of it because they're so aware, even their reading of Genesis, right? With Satan in the garden, that's not a Jewish tradition. That is a Christian tradition. So even the reading of the Quran is through a Christianish lens. And I use ish because a lot of the scholars think it's oral traditions down in Arabia and there is no Arabic Bible. So they don't have like Arabic Bible scripts. It's all oral traditions being passed on down here in Arabia. But yeah, if you can give me the source and email that to me, I would be more than happy to discuss that at some point in a further episode for sure, Paul. I really appreciate you bringing that up too. I just, I never heard of that in that source. Thank you so much. I'm scrolling. Uh, Inquisitive mind. Okay, what about Francesca Stavlakopoulou? Link me up. <laughs> She's dating somebody or married too. I don't know. I don't know their dating situation. Look, look, I am not your guinea pig, Okay. I'm not, you don't pay me enough. How about that? No, seriously though, um, both of them are in relationships. One's married. I don't know about the other one, but um, <laughs> I don't really know much about Francesca's uh, situation. But, you know, these are brilliant people and they're women in scholarship. And you got to appreciate that for sure. So I will take this as a compliment, of course, Ghost. I appreciate it. Thanks for being the ghost of Myth Vision. Stop scamming man is back again. Jeez, I all of these are indulgences for any sins committed past, present, and future. Okay, thanks a lot. Even as shock portrays Arabs as proudly believing themselves descendants of Abraham and speaks of Muhammad fighting in the Kaaba's interior, a model of a dove and picture of Mary and Jesus among the idols. Interesting, even as shock portrays Arabs as proudly believing themselves descendants of Abraham. Yeah, they're definitely, there's literature, they call them Saracens from the Greek. It's a Greek derivative, but it is definitely something that was called of the Arabs in that region. But they were saying that they were Ishmaelites and not from uh, Isaac. Speak of Muhammad fighting or finding in the Kaaba. I said fighting when I first read that. That's why I was like, huh? Uh, Muhammad finding in the Kaaba's interior a model of a dove and picture of Mary and Jesus among the idols. Hmm. It wouldn't shock me. I mean, the Quran is engaging in this debate, right? It wouldn't shock me if there's some history of them considering these Christians who have idols and images of Mary. It wouldn't shock me one bit. And in fact, at this time, they're having numismatic debates in the Christian political spectrum, religious political spectrum, where you're not allowed to have images of Jesus or Mary or things like that. So they're trying to cut out all of that. There's a book written by um, Andrew Casper, who talks about the iconography. And his book is actually about the Shroud of Turin. So he goes through how Christians depict art. But he talks about at this time that there's a lot of debate amongst having images, period. And maybe this is happening down in Arabia as well. Maybe there's a Christian debate against. Maybe there were Christians who were saying, stop, no more images. And this sect down here, this version of Arabic Christianish type of group um, adopted this and said no. And maybe adopted some of the pre-Islamic Arabic ideas of fate, which they had uh, like a predestinarian fatal idea to the God and made like a mixture here. Something was birthed new. Don't know. It's interesting. I really do love learning this kind of stuff. And that's why I can't wait to see more pre-Islamic inscriptions in Arabic, Syriac, you name it, that kind of help us to try and understand what was going down, down in Arabia in these regions. Appreciate that super chat for real. Sina or Sina? I don't want to butcher your last name. Ayo, Armin from Atheist Republic has been digging deep into Islam's origins. It would be really nice if you guys got together. I have interviewed Armin, and I'm curious to know what he, I mean, I'd be happy to hear what he has to say about Islam and its origins. I've actually interviewed him as an ex-Muslim on the channel, so maybe we can make that happen at some point and see what he has to say. I know there's different views out there. But I have, specifically on MythVision, 
purposefully, purposefully trying to get the academics. I want the scholars. I want the the heavy hitting PhDs that are in the programs and that know this material as much as I can because, like, these are the guys that are at the cutting edge of the latest research of knowing what's going on, the debate in the academic community of what's what is actually happening. And I think it's important to do both, but also get what experts say in the field. I, I can go and interview, for example, and I'm not equating this, I'm making a point, don't take this bad. But like, if I go and interview someone who's like a plant, a believer in plant medicines, but doesn't believe in any Western medicine or Western science or surgery or anything like that, like, you kind of have to be like, hold on, be very careful. I'm not equating that, but I am going to say that when I look at non-academic people on YouTube trying to get at the sources and understand the origins of Islam, if it's from a polemicist, uh, a polemicist, apologetic Christian who's trying to tell you the origins of Islam, sometimes they see things that Muslims won't look at. And I, and I can, you know, relate and say, oh, wow, that's interesting. You bring up a good point. But then sometimes it's almost conspiracy land of anything goes as long as it's not true. And Muslims are like, really? Come on. So I'm more interested in academic historical research. And it's like, you can make your own mind up after you've studied it and look at it. And um, I kind of want to be able to do both. But I also want to lean toward the academic side of like, how do we really assess the information and data? We can have all the conversations we want non-academically, but it's important we do have the academic one. And I don't think you were anyway saying not to. But Armin is a friend of mine, and I'd be happy to have a discussion with him at some point. I don't know what he's been up to. I just had him on one time, and we're really good people. Like, we get along good. So, Stop scamming, man. Would you be interested in buying Ibn, Ibn Ishak's The Life of Muhammad translated by Alfred Gulami? If I chat you 30... That will cover it, and it's available on Amazon. Absolutely. Heck yeah, I'll buy it right now. Yes. Uh, but I, I love to get books like this, too. I love to learn all of this stuff. So let me um, let me see. Toss me that 30, man. I'll be happy, without a doubt, spending the money right now. YouTube doesn't pay me for the month, but I'd be happy to do it right now. Stop scamming, man. Keep making it rain. Derek's going to learn today. <laughs> Metalhead ain't playing, is he? Oh, man. Doc Pluromanat says, to be fair, you and Bob did interview Australian Jesus. Good times. You know what's funny? I went upstairs earlier, and my wife was actually looking at that video. What are the odds? Very, very weird that you bring that up. But yeah, that was a fun interview. I thought that was fun. The guy wrote me the most passive-aggressive bitching email I've ever had from anyone I've ever interviewed on my channel, anyone. And I've had some passive aggressive emails, but Jesus in Australia, he is a dick. Okay. Like straight up. And this dude was not having the way that I put Jesus statues in that, in that interview. He wasn't having it. And, um, what else? In the email, it was just really obnoxious. And I went to defend like Bob. And I was after a while, I, I had enough. I emailed his wife, who is Mary Magdalene. And I said, I hope you're not under duress or being under some type of coercive relationship with this. Like it got real dramatic with me and Jesus from Australia. I have to add from Australia because he thinks he's Jesus. Yeah. Uh, the poor people who are duped by that guy, it sucks. Like there's people who've divorced their husbands because of this guy. All right. Did I catch up? I, I think I caught up. Okay. I caught up. So stop scamming, man. I'm looking for the 30 and I'm pulling it up on Amazon and I'm clicking purchase when you, when you drop that joker. I need to get the exact name of this, this book here. Even a shocks. Even shocks. The life of Muhammad. Okay, and you said by um, a. Let me look at this Joker here. Alfred uh, Gilam Gilame. Forgive me if I butcher the name. Okay, so life of Muhammad. Here we are. It's got a sunrise picture, right? Let me make sure just to pop it up here. This is the one. 
Life of Muhammad. Making sure we're here. Is that the one? I want to make sure we're right here. Stop. Waiting on you to say, yes, <laughs> I don't want to buy the wrong one. You got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You rock. Latest Christmas present ever. How? Uh, anyhow, Armin Navabi can undoubtedly tell you everything about the uh, Uyghur situation. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Maybe I need to get him on and talk about that and see what's going on there. Because I think this is my thoughts. And anyone who clips this, I'm going to buy this right now, by the way. Um, I think that uh, Armin tries to be as balanced and fair as he can. The one, the few times I do take the time to watch some of the lives he does, I think he is trying to be as fair to people who are Muslims. He has spoken out against um, against uh, nationalists in India, Indian nationalists that are like death to Muslims and stuff. There's all sorts of crazy stuff. So I know that he's a humanist and I know he wants to try and be as fair and balanced as he can. I don't know all of his views about everything, but I know that he's tried and I try to give him the benefit of the doubt in anything that he's trying to say, especially someone who probably gets a lot of crap as an ex-Muslim. Okay, grabbing the book right now. Let me see here. Okay, so it's saying it'll be, let me get my cart. So it'll be here at the end of the month. So a little bit of a little bit of a wait. Um, hit proceed to check out. I don't want you guys seeing my information. You might show up at my door one day. That would be bad. My wife would be like, who is this person? All right, placing order. Okay, it's uh, order placed. Thanks. Confirmation, we sent your email. All right, you did it. You forced me, Stop Scamming Man. You for I was coerced by 30 euros, or is that pounds? I think it's euros. I could be wrong. The angle of the, the E. Either way, you forced me, you coerced me. Everyone saw it. I undoubtedly had to do what I had to do. But that will be here uh, at some time at the end of January. I really appreciate the support. And I look forward to reading the account to see how... This exegete, this scholar, someone who believes they're following in the footsteps of Muhammad, how they understood and interpreted it. The interesting thing about this, and this kind of is another one of those blows to being more skeptical and curious of being doubtful of the truth of all of this, is these scholars and exegetes, they, from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, they're, they're trying to find a chain of command. So they're doing everything they can to say like, no, 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 this really goes back to the prophet. Or, or at least some other authors in the Hadith traditions are trying to come up with a science. Ithnad, is it Isnad or something like that? I can't remember how they pronounce it. They have a science of trying to say, this goes back to Muhammad. So if most Muslims are believing that what they're saying is true and went back to Muhammad, that's bad for the religion. That is where being critical of Islam is important. And nobody does it better, I hope, than Muslims. And I hope that they'll start to do that more. Max the Confessor, you can look up more academic papers, but the quotations are short. I'll post the link in the chat. Will it allow you to post a link? Is there a link? I don't know if you can post links in the chat. Worst case, Max, is email me. Worst case. Please, don't, don't forget you can email me. I did put, I'm going to put it in the chat again because I am always interested in this kind of stuff. It's really interesting. MythVisionPodcast at gmail.com. All right. Someone said, you say it perfectly. Um, I Thank you, Lily. I really appreciate that. I hope I'm saying it at least somewhat okay. My wife would disagree, right? She'd be like, he ain't perfect. He ain't perfect. Don't listen to him. <laughs> oh, that's the basis of the Hadith. Isnad. Yeah, that's the word, man. I'm learning, man. Give me some credit. Everybody, give me a little credit. I am um, new to it, but um, I'm learning. And Isnad is the science that they, they did. But that, there's reasons to doubt that. And uh, wow, I'm, I'm starting this journey of figuring out 
This is a whole world. Like if you've never entered Islam, like in terms of the research critically and stuff, and you're like, oh, I understand Jesus and like New Testament Bible stuff and Hebrew Bible, and I'm involved in the Bible, but never really the Quran or Islam, you're in for a ride. There is so much. It's a whole nother world, even though it's Abrahamic. It's a whole nother world of tradition that has a life of its own. And there is so much stuff here. Azazel? Forgive me if I butchered that. This is my favorite new channel. <laughs> Thank you. That makes me feel good. I, I'm a, my mission is being accomplished. Doc Pluromanat resource answering Islam.com is very academic. Okay. Okay. Although a Christian resource. So there's stuff. I'm very careful, right? Because I know there's polemic. I know there's polemic. But you could probably gain some insight to a lot of this stuff. And if it's if it's Christians arguing against Islam to defend their worldview, it's like, mm, you know, is there a motivating factor that causes you to see wrong? Am I being motivated by bad biases? Is there something that I'm doing that isn't allowing me to pierce through and properly assess the information? Maybe that's the case sometimes, but at least I'm willing to admit like that could happen. I'm sure that could happen, but I, there are methodologies that can help that can help me to rule those biases out. And if we can stick to rigorous, good methodology, whatever my biases are, you know, we can get to the fact, right? We could try to get to the best explained explanation there is. And I'm hoping that happens. Okay. I caught up here, Derek. I appreciate your sincerity, man. Wish we could have a conversation sometime, buddy. Omar, Maybe we can, <laughs> maybe we can. Um, I, I, I've been busy and I haven't really done live streams. I had to come on and hang out with you all. I, I saw this in a recent email from a friend. I have to late leave anonymous. They always tell me, keep my name out of it all. But they, they notified me. I had already seen it, but it didn't come to my attention that I should do something about it. Then I saw the email a few days ago and then I thought, you know what? I think I should really cover this and talk about why what happened in this academic setting was wrong. I mean, the, this is my thoughts, but I left a poll up to give people an opportunity to vote. The chat is always there. I try not to censor my chats unless people are being derogatory. Like you can have differing opinion, you can debate, but if you're rude and you're going above and beyond, you know, we're going to, we're going to keep that stuff under control. Um, uh, but yeah, let me let me do this poll. Let's see what the poll looks like. And then we're going to wrap things up because I do need to get some food. I am I am burning on fumes right here. My fuel, right? Okay, let's go up here uh in poll. I've learned the hard way last time I thought, "Oh my god, the poll disappeared." Should they have fired, I said, the professor for showing art depicting Muhammad? 91% say no. 8%. 8% of people say yes. There were 433 votes. If my math and I have, man, I did, I did calculus in high school and it's been so long since doing math. Let me make sure I have this properly here. 433. Uh, let's do, is it, uh, Divided by 0.91, if I'm not mistaken. 400, hold on, help me out. How do I do the damn math here? 433 votes to get to the percentage here. My brain is so shot. Times 0.91. So 394 people pretty much voted uh, no. Am I right about this math? Tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah, 32 people. So I was right. Okay. 30 people, 32, 32 people said yes. Wow. That's actually more than I thought we would get. 8% is too much. Should be zero. I agree. Uh, I don't know. Someone's. Hmm. Okay. You guys are debating and stuff. That's probably what's going on here. All right. So yeah. Wow. I'm kind of shocked. I'm not going to lie that there was that many people who actually thought that what she did was absolutely wrong, but I imagine the votes would have, I can't, I'd be shocked. I wish I would have had another vote and said if there were everybody there, but I'm not going to waste the time. 
it's like I would be shocked to find that it wasn't um, Sunni conservative Muslims who voted yes. If there was someone who wasn't, I'd be shocked to know unless they're so far in the sensitive side. This is that point where your brain falls out kind of. You're so on this sensitivity side that you don't realize you're actually harming by going that far. And I'm left leaning, right? I'm a liberal. Like I but I am not so ridiculous my brain falls out. So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Anywho, um I try to stay away from politics, but this one kind of does get political, but it is religious and that's why I made it uh something worth talking about. I hope that everybody in the chat enjoyed this discussion. And I hope that your vote counted. And I hope that this freaking university reverses what they did. I would understand under different kinds of circumstances doing what happened. Not in this one. This was just downright wrong in the approach. So I appreciate you all. Thank you for tuning in. I'd love to spend more time with you, but I'm afraid I'm going to end up uh, dying of starvation if I don't go and put some fuel in my stomach, I've been editing right before I did this live. I've been working my butt off. Hit the like button, drop a comment, share this with one of your friends, and um, never forget that we are Myth Vision. Go in the description, join the Patreon, check out the courses. Man, we've got so much stuff coming up. I really appreciate you all, seriously. And uh, here we are to our outro. Mm -hmm.